Welcome to the world of your own terrifying imagination. Mark Twain once said, Everyone talks about the weather, but no one does anything about it. The same thing might be said of the state of morality in the world today. Everyone talks about immorality and corruption, but no one seems to do anything about it. Can we do anything about it? This is the story of a group who tried with results like this. Oh, no. Please. Please. Help! Oh, my feet. They're on fire. They're burning up. Oh, Prometheus. Promos. Help me. Please. Help me. Stop the burning. I believe. Now. I believe. I... mystery drama, Ordeal by Fire, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Mandel Kramer and Julie Newmar. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Prometheus' gift of fire to man was a blessing, bringing warmth, cheer, enabling man to cook his food and also protect him from wild beasts. But along with the benefits came drawbacks. Fire proved to be destructive and sometimes deadly, and man used it often to destroy. Thus was born the warning, don't play with fire. However, those who created one warning didn't follow their own advice, and they inevitably learned that they should have. Bob! Bob! Over here! Ava! I wired you not to meet me at the plane. I had to. Bob, I'm so glad you're here. Darling. I've missed you. Me too, darling. I know I shouldn't have sent you that silly cable, but, Bob, I am so frightened. It's all right now. It is all right. No, no, it isn't. I know how important your China trip was to you, but I had to bring you back. I tried to handle this myself, but it's Handle what? Not here. Let's have a cup of coffee and I'll try to explain. just don't understand. What's your father afraid of? I don't know, and he won't tell me. That's why I sent for you, Bob. Maybe he'll talk to you. You know, darling, if you were anyone else except the level-headed, beautiful girl that I'm going to marry, I'd say this whole thing was nonsense. You won't say it after you see Dad. You won't recognize him. Why, you mean he's changed physically? Not so much in appearance, but in his attitude. You know the way Dad was completely self-assured, positive. Yes, and sometimes wrong. Of course, who isn't? But you don't get to be the head of one of the largest corporations in the country by running scared. And Bob, believe me, Dad's terrified. Can you picture Vern Marcus scared? What's going on, Vern? Oh, nothing much, Bob. Just having my study remodeled. It looks like you're making it into a bank vault. You got to store your money here? <laughs> what uh, brings you back to the States? I thought you planned to stay in China two months. You're the reason I'm here, Vern. Mm, you've evidently been allowing Ava to fill your head with a lot of nonsense. Nonsense? Well, I, I don't know what she told you, you didn't but... tell me that you were turning your study into a fortress or electrifying the fence around the house, but... She told me enough to convince me that I was right to come back. What's frightening you, Vern? Now, leave me alone. Just leave me be, that's all. Is that too much? Much too much. Stop thinking about yourself and think of what you're doing to Ava. Ava has nothing to do with this. No? How would you feel if your daughter built herself a fortress and locked herself in, turning from an outgoing, beautiful girl to a frightened, petulant child, asking only to be left alone? Would you try to help? All right, Bob. You win. 
One promise. You mustn't tell Ava. But she's frantic with worry. I have to tell her something. No. At least let me tell her that you've confided in me. That will help. That's all you'll tell her? You promise? I promise. All right. My telling you isn't going to do any good. I'm caught, that's all. Caught by what? The Promethean Society. What's that? It's a small, secret society dedicated to doing something about the lack of morality in the world today. All right, but what do you mean you're caught? I have one week to give the leader of the society, a, a man who calls himself Promus, one million dollars. Um, for what? Well, ostensibly to spread the message of the society. Well, what kind of work do they do that takes a million dollars? A public relations campaign. Newspaper advertising, television, radio. There are even discussions of making a motion picture, and that takes money. Well, I don't see the problem, Vern. If you really feel that this is worthwhile, you make the contribution. If you don't, you tell them you won't go along. I'm afraid that's not possible. Oh, come on, Vern. What are they going to do if you say no? Rather than tell you, I'll show you. <laughs> Timmy, Bob Steele remembers you. I'm sure you remember him. Sure. sure. I remember, Bob. How are you? Well, I'm fine, but what are you doing in the wheelchair? Learning how to operate the darn thing. I can move it pretty good. It's the brakes that bother me. Oh, watch it. That's all right. I, I've got you. Oh, thanks. Now, Vern, what brings you here? Uh, actually, it was Bob. Uh, Bob? What can I do for you? Well, Vern seems to be passing the buck. I'm trying to find out what's got him so uptight, and he told me that... What have you done, Vern? What have you told him? Well, nothing yet. You see, Ava cabled me in China because she was so worried, and I came back to try to help. How much have you told him, Vern? Well, about our joining the Promethean Society, and uh, that they've asked me for a million in contributions, and they asked you for half that, and you didn't pay. Well, Bob wanted to know what happened to you, so I brought him here to show you. You want to see what happened to me, Bob? Unwrap the blankets around my legs. What? Do as he says. And look at his feet. Good Lord. What happened? Third degree burns. The doctor tells me scar tissue will take about six months to form. Oh, my. And then I can start to learn to walk again. How, how, how did it happen? Well, I was here, in my house. One day, my, my feet just burned up. Tell him to me. That day was just two days after you refused to contribute the half million dollars that Promus had requested. Ava, darling, get off my back. Oh, Bob, what's happening to us? Why are we so ugly to each other? Because something pretty ugly is going on. And you don't think I'm old enough to be laid in on it? Look, I've already explained to you that I gave your dad my word. But at least tell me how you're going to help him. Will you be satisfied with that? I guess I'll have to be. All right. You remember me telling you about a buddy of mine in Vietnam? I think so. His name was Brian. Brian... Yes, Brian Casey. He went from Marine Sniper Scout to the Chemical Warfare Branch, and now he runs a private detective agency. Now, he should be here in five minutes. Wish us luck. <laughs> do it, Bob. I just can't. Burn. think what we're asking. Only to stall. He'll tell me I've had enough time. I, I've known about this for weeks. He's right, Bob. Look, Casey, I brought you here because I believed you could help. Now, if you're going to agree with him... Just stalling isn't enough, Bob. We've got to have a plan. Before I can even think of anything, I've got to see what this organization looks like and how it operates. I've told you, Mr. Casey. It's not good enough. I have to attend one of those meetings. I just don't believe that any man can control fire. Mm, then how do you explain what happened to Timmy Burns? I can't. Yet. And we still can't be sure that Burns told it like it happened. Well, Timmy has no reason to lie. Then you must believe that this promos can control fire. I only know what I saw. I saw his feet, too. After whatever happened, happened. What could have happened? Except what Timmy told us. Well, tell you one thing that could have happened. Two rough gents could have called on Burns, tied him up, gagged him, and 
roasted his feet. I saw his feet, Casey. This couldn't have been done with matches. Bob, you know better than that. Now think back when we were in Vietnam. Remember the defoliants? Flamethrowers? Well, these guys could have used that on him. Well, then why wouldn't he tell us? Because they told him not to. And he sure would listen after they finished with him. Never thought of that, but it is possible. No, you don't know Promus. <laughs> you think he's a nice guy who wouldn't stoop to a thing like that? Well, I don't know what he is. A fanatic or a blackmailer. But there's an aura of power about him and a certainty. Now, I don't know, but I'm sure that he doesn't have to use others. And certainly not thugs like you described. Well, that's why I have to meet him and see his operation. That's the only way I can help. And I don't see what good that'll do. Let's look at your options, Vern. One, you can pay. <laughs> Just the first in a long string of payments. Two, you can blow the whistle and go to the district attorney. But what? Tell him you joined the secret society willingly, that it's dedicated to restoring the moral tone of the world, and that you've uh, been asked for a contribution. That's and it... why I haven't considered the police. Or three, you can believe me when I tell you that Casey here is the toughest, most competent, and most highly trained private operative I know, in addition to being a buddy of mine from Vietnam. I'm not downgrading Casey. I, I just don't see what he offers. A long shot. Uh, you can take me to your scheduled meeting tomorrow night and introduce me as a sinner who's, uh, who's seen the light. I'm an ex-Marine, a Vietnam veteran. Well, I made a bundle in the black market, and now I want to give some of it to the Promethean Society to, uh, <laughs> to make the world a better place. But uh, I want to see before I give. And the reason uh, you don't have the million is that you wanted Promo's approval to allow me to chip in with you. That makes sense, Vern. Yeah. And if Promo's doesn't go for it or I come up with nothing, you can always pay. How are you feeling, Vern? Nervous. Very nervous. I wish Bob could have come. <laughs> Relax. Just do it the way we rehearsed it. You would let it perfect. But what if Promus asks me uh, about... No, no, no. I'll handle the questions if they're about me. Now, clue me in again on the way this affair is run. Hmm? It'll take your mind off what's worrying you. Well, the members all gather in the club room. Very austere, but comfortable. We generally chat with each other, and then when a gong sounds, we go into the assembly hall. That's a, a large room. Mm -hmm. I, I think it used to be a ballroom. It's been fixed. It has a stage at one end of the platform. And that's where Promo stands when he talks. That all? Well, there's the fire, but uh, you know about that. At a certain point in his address, he raises his arms and extends them in the white and gold robe. And suddenly, he's consumed by fire. But it never burns him. Never. And you have no idea where the fire comes from? None. We've all talked about it. At first, we thought it was some magician's trick, but, but we can't be sure. You never had the stage checked out? Well, we talked about it, but we never did. Uh, here we are. You know... You will have to meet Promos before you can get into the meeting. All you have to do is introduce me. The rest will be up to me. So, you would like to join the Prometheans, Mr. Casey? Well, that's, that's why I'm here. Uh, what's with this bit about uh, uh, taking your shoes off? And if and when we accept you, we'll explain our rituals. Yeah, but we do not allow you into the inner chamber with your shoes on. Now, what do you know about the Prometheans? Well, only what Vern Marcus told me. And what was that? Well, it was pretty general that you were an organization doing something about the shocking philosophy in our contemporary society that anything goes as long as it makes a buck. Now, why do you feel so strongly about it? <sighs> Atonement. Atonement? For what? Yeah, for, for my sins. Now, this is not a confessional, and I am not a priest, Mr. Casey. We're engaged in a very secular battle here against the forces that have distorted and corrupted the moral values all over the world. And we intend to use the very same instruments that did the corrupting. Well, I, I, I apologize, but I, 
I wasn't being flip. Maybe Vern told you I was in Vietnam in the Marine Corps. I know this isn't a confessional, and you're not interested in my life story, but I made a fortune then. Opium? No, 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 not quite that bad. Black market. I sold everything I get my hands on. Yes. Now, while I'm greatly flattered that you want to join the Promethean Society, I'm sure you're unaware of our admission procedures. Now, we have always selected our members, and only because of Vernon Marcus's stature and the substantial contribution he's making to the society did I consent to see you this evening. Uh, now, wait a minute. I just... Now, much as I sympathize with people like you, you're not the type of member we seek. You know, up until five minutes ago, I thought your organization was doing something, but <laughs> now I think different. Now, what do you think now, Mr. Casey? I think maybe you are money-hungry like I was in Vietnam, and you want to stick Marcus for the million and figure on picking up another half million for me later on. If that's what you think, Mr. Casey, I'd be delighted if you'd stay for the meeting. You mean that? I never say anything I don't mean. The world is made up of believers and non-believers. The two disparate groups argue about anything and everything from the existence of ghosts to the importance of dream research. But few of the arguers ever get down to gritty reality. In just a moment, Brian Casey will see for himself the existence and power of Promethean fire as controlled by Promos when we return with Act Two. Have you ever noticed how much atmosphere plays a part in our lives? For example... It would never occur to anyone to hold a seance in a subway. And although the Promethean Society did not feature ghostly voices and trumpets and tambourines, its inner room or shrine was austere and impressive with straight-backed chairs and organ music setting the proper atmosphere. The only light came from two flaming braziers on either wall. Promos, resplendent in a white and gold robe, stood at a lectern on a slightly raised stage. Welcome, Prometheans. Just as Prometheus brought man the gift of fire centuries ago, so are we dedicated to remind man that his salvation lies not in unbridled freedom and corruption, but in shoring up the wavering standards of morality and truth. Tonight, we extend a welcome to Brian Casey, a man who has indicated his desire to join with us, and who, after he has passed our scrutiny and been accepted, will undergo the rites of purification with which you are all familiar. Uh, you have a, a question, Mr. Johnson? I do. Uh, as everybody here knows, I'm a businessman. And uh, like everyone here, I joined the society with very high hopes. Uh, yes, Mr. Johnson. Well, uh, well, put it bluntly, hopes haven't been realized. Now, could you be more specific? Well, we all know it takes money to amount a campaign of the proportions you outlined to us, and we all contributed at the onset. Now, some of us have made further and ex <clears throat> exceedingly generous contributions, and I still haven't seen anything that, in a business sense, would would justify these outlays. Now, you are asking for an accounting. Well, I, I'm asking for some sort of indication that something's being done. Now, you ask for a sign, a hopeful sign, which you expect to find on the page of a ledger. Uh, no, no. And uh, you shall have it. Uh, Dusalian, uh, bring Mr. Johnson the ledger. Uh, no, I, I didn't mean to imply that... Uh, hand it to him, uh, Dusalian. Uh, look, uh, Promos... I didn't mean to upset you. I only asked, as any businessman would ask, to, to get some idea of where the, the money... Take it. Well, now, look, this is ridiculous. Do you want me to... Do you want me to look at it now? Yes. Take the ledger. And now, Prometheus, O oh firebringer, give our friend a sign. A sign, O oh firebringer. A sign. Oh, what? The ledger's on yeah, fire. <coughs> drop it, oh, Johnson. It. Drop it. Yeah, oh, fear not. Fear not. We are all safe. 
None of us has transgressed. I now call upon Prometheus for another sign. A sign directly for me. Watch now, Casey. Watch. You see, Casey? The man's a sheet of flame. He, he should be burned alive. But he'll emerge unharmed when the flames die down. It's a miracle, Casey. It's impressive. But I don't believe in miracles. <laughs> Well, Casey, what did you think of the meeting? I can shake you up pretty good. I'll tell you more when we get into the car and start home. Uh, Mr. Marcus. Uh, Mr. Marcus. Uh, yes, Promus. Haven't you forgotten something? Oh, uh, you, you mean... Uh, your contribution. The society has been counting on it. Uh, of course, of course. Uh, you, you understand that I've had some difficulty in... Uh, you've had plenty of time. I know. But I can't... Have you changed your mind about making the contribution? Oh, no, no. Not at all. I I was just waiting for Mr. Casey here. And to... Mr. Casey informed me of his wish to contribute. But I must ask you, Mr. Marcus, in front of Mr. Casey here, are you completely familiar with his background? Why, uh... Yes, I think so. Now, what are you getting at, Promos? Uh, you're not yet a member. We cannot accept outside contributions. Well, what's that got to do with my background? Now, your background will determine whether or not we accept you. <laughs> That's fair enough. If you accept me, you can take my half million. If not, it's up to Marcus to make the total million dollar contribution. Yes, yes, I will. When can I expect to hear about my application? Mm, I should say within the next 48 hours. Uh, yes, uh, definitely within that time. <laughs> Well, now that we're back home, Casey, what do you think? Forty is a four-dollar bill. Well, what do we do? Blow the whistle, Bob. Go to the DA. Raid the joint. I guarantee you, you'll find all sorts of gimmicks that produce the fire Promos uses. You're being blackmailed. You don't want to give the Promethean Society a million bucks, do you? No. Yeah, but you're afraid that if you don't... Stop right there. Now, you saw what happened to Timmy Burns. That's what I'm afraid of. Do you have any explanation as to how Timmy's feet were so badly burned? Oh, not at the moment. I thought I did when we were made to bathe our feet in water at the purification rites, but my theory was wrong. What did you think it was? I thought, Bob, there might be some delayed action chemical in the water which might have caused the burns. But I checked my feet after I got home. Nothing. Just plain water. Well, what's the next move, then? Now, before we talk about any next moves, I need a straight answer to two questions. One, can either of you guarantee that nothing's going to happen to me? Two, if we call in the police, can they give me the same guarantee? The answer to both questions must be no. Casey, thank you for your trouble. I'll send you a check. It's been nice to meet you. Goodbye. Now, wait a minute, Vern. You haven't heard... I've heard all I need to. It's not your skin that's in danger of being charred. Neither of you have anything to risk. I've made my decision. I'm going to pay. Casey, Associates. Ah, Mr. Casey. How fortunate I reached you so promptly. Who is this? You don't recognize the voice? Promos? Exactly. Now, I don't suppose I have to spell out our decision on your application. I don't understand. Oh, come now, Mr. Casey. The little game is over. Since I've called you at your office, you must realize I know you're a private investigator. So? Well, surely you don't expect the Promethean Society to... I'm a private investigator. Now, does that make me a second-class citizen? If you've done any checking at all, you've found out that I was in Vietnam and that the rest of what I told you is true. Uh, please don't excite yourself, Mr. Casey. Uh, private investigators are, by nature and profession, skeptics. Uh, philosophically, you can't possibly be attuned to our lifestyle. Uh, therefore, it's my irrevocable decision to refuse you membership. I called because I wanted to tell you this personally. Uh, okay. Your candy store. Uh, not entirely, Mr. Casey. 
Although my instincts tell me you don't accept it, there is a god involved. Do you remember Prometheus? Uh, look, Promos. I would like to hire you, Mr. Casey. What? You do undertake assignments that are uh, of a protective nature? Yes, but I... I it would be to our mutual advantage if you would. I have reason to believe that my life may be in danger. Are you willing to work for me? You'd be wasting your money. It's my money. Well, I'll, I'll think about it. Now, while you're thinking, uh, consider the fact that if you were really serious about wishing to join us, you might be doing me an even larger service by keeping me alive so that the work of the society can go on. It's a good point. As I said, I'll, uh, I'll think about it. No good, Mr. Casey. But uh, don't think too long. I'll tell you, Mr. Marcus, he's getting nervous. Otherwise, he'd never have tried to hire me. Maybe it's true. No way. Promos needs protection as much as an intercontinental ballistics missile. You agree with me, Bob? Well, it looks that way. Well, I don't see how it changes my situation. I still have 24 hours to pay. Correct. But if he's running scared, and it looks like he is, then he's got something to be scared about. Look, he's very big on Greek mythology with all this Prometheus stuff, but he's got to have an Achilles heel somewhere, and he's afraid we might find it. Um, uh, excuse me. Hello. Uh, good evening, Mr. Marcus. I'm not taking you away from anything, am I? Oh, nothing important. Uh, fine. I called to ask if you were aware that the guest you brought the other night was a private investigator. Uh, you, you mean, uh, Brian Casey? Uh, yes. Uh, does that disturb you? Uh, somewhat. A man of his type is hardly Promethean society material. I'm sorry if I made an error in judgment. It, I thought... it doesn't matter. I've just called to tell you that Casey will not become a member, and therefore you are responsible for the entire million-dollar contribution. You understand? Yes. Yes, I understand. My feet! Oh, my feet! They're burning! What? Oh, get something! What? I saw the burning! Oh, stop burning! burning. In, in the kitchen! Oh. Are you Hurry. talking to me, Mr. Marcus? I'm sorry. There's some oh, trouble here. Oh. No, I'm sorry, but... Uh... You'll uh, have the money tomorrow night. Goodbye. Oh, oh. call a doctor. Oh, help me. Don't oh. throw your feet under oh. your body. Oh. Hey, oh, I swear. Put oh. your feet in here. Ah. Oh! Oh! Merciful oh. Lord in heaven. Oh. Look at the water, Bob. Oh. Boiling. What can turn a pail of ice water into a bubbling cauldron? Promos would say it's Promethean fire. What would you say? What would you do if you were in Vernon Marcus' shoes? We'll be back shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago, 34 degrees officially, 35 at the Loop and Lake Front. If any human could control fire, he could easily rule the world. Unless this power was granted to him by Prometheus and could only be used when Prometheus gave his permission and blessing. That is the claim of Promos, the head of the Promethean Society. We return to our story to find Brian Casey in a wheelchair, with his feet badly scarred and burning for revenge. Hello? Bob? Casey, where are you? I'm at my office. But your feet... I'm in a wheelchair. Now they tell me I'll be back walking in less than three months. You've got to do me a favor. Of course. When's the next meeting of the Promethean Society? Now, look, Casey, I don't want to interfere, but don't you think you want to lay off now? Tell me. Then I'll ask you the favor. The next meeting is this Friday night. Did Marcus pay the million? He's handing it over tonight. Where? Well, I don't know, but... Listen, closely. 
I want you to persuade Marcus to invite Promos to a big shindig at his house tonight. I don't know whether... It shouldn't be too hard, but it's vital. Why wouldn't a guy come to a party to pick up a million bucks? Casey, you ought to know better than anyone that Promos isn't just a guy. We both know he likes money. Marcus can say that he wants to make a big publicity deal out of the party. There'll be a lot of tycoons there. It'll be an opportunity for Promos to meet them. Some of them should be interested in the Promethean Society. And think of the impression it'll make when Marcus hands over the million. Well, it's a point. It'll work. And think of the impression Promos will make when he shows up in his robes. Why would he wear the ceremonial robes? Because they're impressive. Because he's a ham at heart. And because he has to for my plan to work. Your plan? What plan? It's better that you don't know. In case something goes wrong. Well, Casey, you're asking to use Vern's house. And I give you my word Vern can't get into trouble. Now, you've got to make the shindig come off. Why? What's so important about Promos coming to a party? Because after he gets there, you're going to spill a glass of whiskey over those ceremonial robes. <laughs> I need you for two jobs at the same place. Now, we never play games, Whitey. This one's rough. It can go all the way. But it's important to me. Now, I'd have come personally to talk to you, but I'm in a wheelchair. I need you, Whitey. Well, I hope you have good news for me, Bob. I did what you wanted. Promos is coming? Yes. It was easier than I thought. Hmm. How'd you bring him around? Uh, I told him we owed you a favor. If this works... You'll be doing yourself a favor. Look, you were kidding about me spilling a drink over Promos, weren't you? I've never been more serious in my life. If you don't do that, there's no point to the party. What in the world is... Be clumsy. A little bump, and there goes the drink all over his robes. Now, you're terribly apologetic. Uh, Insist on having them clean for him. You can improvise the routine. Yeah, I guess. You still want me flying blind, huh? Until Thursday. There's a second part to this operation that has to come off before we stand a prayer. I'll see you back here Thursday at 4. Bob? Hmm? There's something very strange about this party. Nonsense, darling. I'm having a ball. Well, who is this Promos? Oh, he's quite a guy. Does he have anything to there do with... There you are, darling. Enjoying the party? Oh, excuse me, Ben. Hey, do you want a drink? No, thank you. And you don't need another either. Honey, we're not married yet. Dad? Yes? I want to talk to you about this party. Uh, Later, dear, after it's over. Where did you meet this man, Promos? Now, please, this isn't the time to... Well, he's the one who's been giving you the trouble, isn't he? I've told you, Avi, this is the wrong time for me to explain. You'll tell me later? If I can, if I can. Ava, darling, you don't know what you're missing. This bartender really knows how to mix a drink. Why would Dad give this man a million dollars? Probably because he believes in the Promethean Society. Ridiculous. Uh, Don't say that until you've met Promos. He's impressive. He's a creep. Come on, let's go over. I'll introduce you. You may change your mind. Promos. Ah, Mr. Steele. And this, I take it, is your bride-to-be. That's right. Ava Marcus. Delighted. And congratulations to you, Mr. Steele. Uh, Thank you. Oh, you're not drinking? Only wine. Excuse me now. Oh, please don't go yet, Promos. We haven't really had a chance to talk. Watch out, Bob. You're glad. Oh, I'm so sorry. You clumsy fool. Bob, you spilled your drink. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I don't know how that happened. Somebody must have pushed my arm. You did. Pushing it up to your mouth. Well, I'll have your robe cleaned, of course. I know. Uh, No, thank you. Oh, I insist. It was an accident. There's no need to make a case out of it. It was my clumsiness. I'll have it cleaned and sent over to society headquarters. I wouldn't think of it. Now, no offense, Mr. Steele, but this is a ceremonial robe, and I'll see to the cleaning myself. Well, right on time, Bob. Come on, sit down. How are you feeling? Eh, coming along. Uh, you managed to spill the drink over the robe? Yes. How did he react? <laughs> well, he blew up, naturally. I offered to have the robe cleaned, and he wouldn't allow it, huh? How did you know? Because he's not about to let that robe out of his hands. You think he's gimmicked the robe? I think I figured the answer to a lot of his tricks. 
You remember the ledger that burned up in Johnson's hands? Sure. Uh, Probos has definitely had experience with chemicals and combustibles. Now, he's come up with some special ways to use them. Now, that ledger was treated with an unusual substance that would ignite when touched with the heat of a human hand. Yes, but the guy who brought it to him, uh, Dusalian or something... Mm-hmm. It was wearing gloves. Are you sure? Well, I'm sure about the gloves. The rest is an educated guess. I learned a lot about chemicals in Vietnam. Well, how does the robe come into it? I just finished looking over promo ceremonial robe. How'd you get it? Remember Whitey Phillips? Where did you find Whitey? <laughs> He's got a locksmith business. I can't believe it. <laughs> Forgive me for laughing, but that slick crook, a locksmith, is just too much. Well, it's a perfect business for Whitey. Now, he was here ten minutes ago. He brought me promo ceremonial robe. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. Whitey stole it? No, no, not the robe you stained. I told him to lift the clean one. Wait a minute. How did you know there was another one? Well, there'd have to be two robes in case one went out of commission. Uh-huh. And what did you discover when you examined the robe? What I suspected. It was treated with some kind of flame retardant. Well, would that protect his face? I mean, Byrne told me he doesn't wear a mask or anything like that. I know. I've wondered about that, too. Now, those flames leap all over. Now, if he had something that blew strong enough to keep the flames from his face... That's pretty risky, isn't it? He's playing for big stakes. Casey, you're obviously convinced that the man is a phony. (laughs) Don't tell me he's got you believing that Prometheus stuff, too. I can't figure him. Look, he wanted to hire you to protect him. All part of the game. He had to get me out to his place so he could fix my shoes. What? The fire that burned me started in my shoes, not in my feet. He made me take my shoes off before I went into his office. Then he must have had the shoe treated with phosphor or some other of these chemicals that ignite under heat. Well, you know, like he did with the ledger. The heat of my body touched off the shoes. That's the same thing he did to Timmy Burns. I think so. What are you going to do? Fight fire with fire? I managed to remove the fire retardant substance from the robe Whitey brought me. I treated it with some chemicals that, uh, (laughs) really like fire. I fixed it so that Prometheus will really have a chance to bring the gift of fire to Promos. Whitey made it. Are you sure? Why shouldn't I be? Byrne just heard that tonight's meeting has been called off. Any reason given? No. Another date set? Indefinitely postponed. Now, do you think maybe Promos suspects something? No, we've got to trust Whitey. Why would Promos call off the meeting? Well, maybe he's uh, maybe he's packing in the entire operation. With Marcus Million, he may figure he's had it. Now, that leaves us up the creek. Only one option. We have got to get that meeting rescheduled. <laughs> Promethean Society. Promos? Speaking. This is Bob Steele. Look, I don't know whether you even want to talk to me because of the way I behaved at the party. Accidents can happen, Mr. Steele. Well, I called because I heard that tonight's meeting had been called off. Yes? And no date had been set for another? Now, that is correct. Oh. Well, I I guess that's that, then. Uh, Mr. Steele, would you mind telling me what you're obviously trying to tell me? Well, it probably wouldn't mean much to you anyway. It was only a small contribution. Contribution? Uh, From whom? From the group that I represent. Uh, You probably don't know them, but we're setting up an import-export business with China, and I talked to them about the society and you, and, of course, I could only tell them what Bernard told me, but they were very impressed. And what has all this got to do with tonight's meeting? Well, it was kind of a wild idea to start. Uh, Without meaning any offense, Mr. Steele, I find it extremely difficult to follow what you're saying. (laughs) Well, I apologize. I guess it's because of that spilled drink I... uh... I still feel embarrassed. I think I ought to just forget the whole thing and return the briefcase with their money. I think it would be a lot better and clear up a confusing situation if you came here and told me just what you have in mind. I'm sorry I took so much of your time, Promos, but I'm sure you understand how my group feels. I'll just take the 50000 back and explain to them that I couldn't witness a demonstration. You are always apologizing for the wrong things, Mr. Steele. First you spill your drink on me. Now you say you're sorry for taking my time when I asked you to come here. 
But you don't apologize for putting me in the position of a cheap magician putting on a magic show for money. I never intended anything. Now, what did you intend? Just what did you tell these business associates? That I was some kind of sideshow freak who would become a fire swallower for a fee? What's the name of this game you want me to play? I'm terribly sorry. I... You're sorry? You've not only insulted me, but Prometheus. Well, I guess there's, there's nothing for me to say. Oh, yes, there is. I'll give you something to say. Go back to your, your associates and your father-in-law and tell them they can come tonight and see Promos and the Promethean Fire. <laughs> I don't like it. What's going to happen? At this point, I don't know. Well, what did Casey say when you told him how Pumas reacted? Good evening. I will extend no welcome to those of you who have come tonight, not because you believe in a cause, but out of curiosity. I don't like this, Bob. Tonight, will you have the courage to face Prometheus, as I do? Oh, Prometheus... Bring me your gift, your gracious gift of the purifying fire. The horn of the fire, the consuming flames that Prometheus... Take it off! Take it off! by the sword, die by the sword. The man who called himself Promos, who lived by fire, died by fire. A flaming, horrible death. A warning to... To whom? To criminals and perhaps a warning from Prometheus not to misuse the gift he brought mankind. I'll be back shortly. chilly, how about pulling up closer to our roaring fire? On second thought, after tonight's tale, that might make you a trifle uncomfortable. I'm sure that like most people, you would like to do something about making people more conscious of the values to be found in human decency and honesty. May I offer one word of advice? If someone asks you to join a society for this purpose, think twice. Our cast included Julie Newmar, Mandel Kramer, Earl Hammond, Guy Sorrell, and Sidney Walker. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. I'm just an old man. A very old man. Why? Well, I, I took it for granted the way you spoke. My son-in-law is a doctor. Manfred Gottlieb. I live with him and my daughter, Bertha. Oh, then, then you know something. You've, you've learned things no, from him. No, I know nothing. Only what I see, what I feel. Did I harm her? No, I even think she's a, a little better. Her eyes, they, they look brighter. Not so full of pain. You did nothing but touch her. Stroke her a little and talk to her. Let me look at your hands. Just hands. What should they be? Well, your hands are warm. On a night like this, more than warm. Hot. Very hot as though they were burning from inside. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams.
Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the terrifying world of your own imagination. The law says, thou shalt not kill. And that's the law most of us openly acknowledge. Yet, there are other laws. Laws and drives that stir primitive, long-forgotten urges, instincts. Laws that raise murder from the worst of sins to the most satisfying of deeds. Hey, please, 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 let me go. Oh, no. I've got you now, Jim. You have no reason to kill me. We're friends. It's nothing personal, Jim. Why? Why? Why do you want to kill me? A hawk kills a rabbit. Why? Because he has to. It's the law of nature. Frank, you're crazy. Put away that knife. I'm a natural man, Jim. I'm only obeying the law of nature. Kill me! <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Diary of a Madman, is based on the story by Guy de Maupassant and was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Homicide is illegal, immoral, and a mortal sin. We condemn and punish the murderer. And yet, from time to time, doesn't an entire nation rise up in righteous anger and slaughter another nation? And so, there are those who, naturally enough, ponder the question. If it's noble to kill for one's country at wholesale, why is it base to kill for oneself at retail. These are the thoughts that occupy the mind of a tall, well-dressed, dignified gentleman. He's walking down a deserted street very late one night in the early summer, some 25 years ago. As he passes a darkened doorway, he hears a gasp. <gasps> oh, what a, what a relief. I beg your pardon. Oh. Is something the matter, Miss? Yeah. Oh, it's only you. Me? Yeah. Yeah, you. I don't believe we know each other, Miss... Uh... Oh, Wilson. Darling Wilson. Oh, my God, it's you. I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, you see, I, I took this job at Benji's Diner. My first night at the job. You know the place? No, I can't say that I do. We'll never go there. Oh, what a bunch of creeps. Anyhow, somebody said this street was a shortcut to the bus stop. And I was walking down the street and I heard these these footsteps coming up right behind me. Well, wouldn't you be scared if you was me? Well, I suppose. Oh, I got so scared. I tried to hide in this doorway. Oh, and it turned out to be you. Well, I'm sorry I frightened you. Oh, forget it. Oh, you're just the kind of person somebody would like to see on a, a lonely, deserted street late at night. Really? Why? Well, you're... You're so well-dressed. Is that all? Well, look. Is it okay if I walk with you as far as the boulevard? I guess it's pretty safe there. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, do you mind if I ask you something? Please do. Uh, I really shouldn't ask strangers such questions, but... What's a person like you doing in a neighborhood like this, anyhow? I uh, was looking for somebody. Down here? Yes. Oh, what kind of person will you be looking for in this part of town? I mean, it's none of my business. By any but... sense, it is your business. It is? How? Oh. Because uh, I happen to be looking for a person like you. What? What did you say? A person like you. What are you talking about? You see, I have a certain urgent need. Now, listen here, mister. If I was that kind of a girl, no, I... No, no, darling. It's obvious you are not that kind of girl. Well, then, what do, you, what do you want from me? I want your life, darling. What are you, huh? what are you saying? <laughs> no, please, get, get out of my way. Oh, 
Oh, no, no darling. Now do let go of me. Let go. No, I can't, you, darling. You, you can't kill me. I never did anything to you. No, of course not. I don't even know you. There's nothing personal in this, Please, darling. Please, I'm scared. Please leave me alone. Oh, please, don't struggle. I won't hurt please. you. It'll be over. Very quickly. I don't want to die. Don't please. Please. <laughs> commands all of us to kill. June 29th. I've done it again. And again, it was so easy and exciting. She struggled desperately. I could feel the wild beating of her heart, the hysterical pounding of pulses. And then the climax of the drama... A single thrust of the blade. And once again, no one will ever know who could possibly suspect me, me. The knife. I carefully cleaned and hid it in my desk. There was blood on my lapel. I scrubbed every trace of it away. Morning, Frank. Good morning, dear. Mm, Everything smells so good. Mm, you mean you've regained your appetite? Well, I don't know. I'm starved. Oh, that's wonderful. I've been so worried about you lately, Frank. What did the poet say, dearest? Come fill the cup. Well, fill my cup and my plate with doubles of everything. What's come over you? Well, I feel like a brand new man today. How was the banquet last night? Oh, the usual political nonsense. Anyone want you to run for the Senate? Well, as they say, the feelers were out. Hmm. Do we want to live in Washington? Oh, darling, that was a bore. I made an excuse and left early. Oh? Where'd you go? Oh, out for a stroll. Hmm. One of your long walks? Mm-hmm. Clears the mind. Doris took your coat to the cleaners. The lapels were all wet. Yes, I, uh... I tripped and fell to the pavement. Oh, you didn't hurt you? No, 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 no. I landed on some grease or paint or something. I tried to wash it off when I got home. Well, you didn't have to bother. Doris said it looked like blood. Oh, that sounds ominous. Anything in the paper? Oh, the usual mess. Plus a nasty little murder. Oh? Mm. A young girl who worked in a diner. Killed on her way home from work. Oh, killed? Huh? Why? How? How? Mm-hmm. Stabbed to death on a deserted street. Oh, what a terrible thing. Mm. She was hardly more than a child. How, how would you know that? Well, you said a young girl. Oh, she was just 18. Oh, but why? Oh, I think it'll turn out to be a lover's quarrel. Really? Mm. They picked up her boyfriend. Seems the two of them had been quarreling. A what? Oh, use of the car. Her parents say she was angry because he took it, but he claims it's as much his as hers. Mm. Well, what do they have on the boy? Well, he's got blood stains on his jacket. Oh, well, that doesn't look good. No. He claims he was out riding around and got into a fight. Oh, with whom? Well, that's the problem. He'd been drinking and can't remember where or with whom. Oh, why do we talk about these things at home, Frank? Isn't it bad enough you have to live with them? June 30th. Although I'm completely above suspicion, I can't afford to be careless. Not that anyone in his wildest dreams would ever suspect. Still, I should be more careful about my clothes. Last time, there were also bloodstains. And yesterday, I'd forgotten to lock my desk drawer. Of course, Estelle never bothers. But still, no one should ever read this diary. I didn't do it. They're lying. They're all lying. Order. Order. Uh, Order. I'll clear this court. The defendant will rise and face the bench. Your Honor, Don't I... you call me your honor, young man. 
By your conduct, you show no respect for the law or for this court. Judge, Judge Wallace, I, I didn't kill her. Why would I kill her? Why? I, I loved her. Young man, you're being given a fair trial. You have every opportunity to prove your innocence. Judge, please. None of them believe me. What are you saying? Everybody thinks I'm guilty. I can tell. But I was cruising around and I got into a fight. I, I got the bloodstains that way. I... I got no alibi, but I didn't do it. You'll have to be seated. And we'll proceed in an orderly fashion. Will the attorney for the people continue his cross-examination? Aren't you going to finish your steak, Estelle? You mean you still have room for more? I'm always this way when I'm trying a case. Well, it must take a great deal out of you. Yes, especially this one. Why this one? Oh, I don't know. Frank, that boy is innocent. Estelle, that's for the jury to decide. No, not completely. It's for you to decide. I think you've decided. How can you say that? By the way you're handling it. Please, Frank. You may not be aware of it, but... Aware of what? Well, you're favoring the prosecutor. Now, that's ridiculous. Well, then... <laughs> it has to be my imagination. I don't understand why we're even talking about this. We never discuss my it's case. just that. Estelle, you're actually pale. What is it? I'm convinced that boy is innocent. Well, if he is innocent, he'll be acquitted. But you know that isn't true. The innocent don't always go free, and the guilty aren't always punished. Estelle, I've never seen you like this well, before. <laughs> I know, and I, I... I I just can't account for it. But I I have this... This conviction. That boy is absolutely innocent. Charlene, this evidence... I don't care about evidence. Now, that's irrational. Well, what can I do? I know. Don't ask me how. I just know. That boy is innocent. Well, then there's every chance the jury will agree with you. No, Frank. That's what makes it so terrible. I don't think the jury will agree with me. I had killed before. But this was the first time somebody was going to pay for it. So it was doubly exciting. I had not only killed her, but in a very real sense, I would also be killing him. He was doomed. I could tell. They were a hanging jury if I ever saw one. They didn't like the boy. I could read the verdict in their faces. And so I went out of my way to give them the kind of charge that would be as favorable to the defendant as I could make it. Because I knew that nothing could save him. They stayed out a whole day, all night, and the better part of the next morning. There was never any doubt in my mind. Peter Simmons... You have been found guilty. Have you anything to say? I, uh... I was brought up to... believe in God... and to believe in justice. And I can tell you... there's going to be justice one day. Not today, but one day... And the person who killed Darlene will never be forgiven. Thanks for picking me up, dear. Yeah, well, I didn't think I could come to court today, but I couldn't stay away. Did you have to hang him? Darlene, it was out of my hands. Mm -hmm. The jury wants him executed. There was no recommendation for mercy. Do you think he's guilty? We don't think about these things, darling. We hold a trial and hear the evidence, and the jury decides. Therefore, he's guilty. Well, I still say he didn't do it. I'm sorry. I heard your summation. You were obviously on his side. November 27th. All of his appeals ran out. He was executed last night. 
I understand he died very well. But it isn't as if I killed him with my own hands. And it's been a long time. A very long time. Since I obeyed the law of nature. I'm growing restless. Oh, honey, I took so much trouble with that chicken. You haven't even touched it. I'm sorry, dear. Oh, you're out of sorts tonight. Actually, honey, you haven't been yourself all week. You've been working too hard. I have a headache. Oh, well, why don't you lie down? No. I think I'll take a walk. Well, it looks drizzly out. Well, that's uh, just the kind of weather I like. <laughs> well, when you decide on one of your walks, there's nothing I can say to stop you. Put on your rubbers and wear a raincoat. Yes, of course, dear. I don't want to have to worry about you. <laughs> Walking may be good for some people, but it can be extremely hazardous for others, especially for someone who might just happen to run into Frank Wallace. As Frank walks calmly through the rain-soaked streets, he sees a short, slight figure just up the block. And once again, there is the quickened pulse, the rapid heartbeat, the flushed face, and Frank's fingers tighten around the knife in his pocket. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. Franklin K. Wallace is a distinguished judge. He's a credit to the community and an ornament to his profession. So what is he doing out late at night on a dark street in a drizzle and fog with a knife in his pocket? moving swiftly toward a man who is walking just ahead of him. What? Uh, oh. Hey, well, I'll be. It's Judge Wallace. Evening, Judge. Oh, it's, uh, uh... Jim Downer, don't you recognize me? Yes, of course. How are you, Downer? Well, I tell you, I'm having a problem. Oh? She says to me, Jim, you're chasing around. And, uh, it's true. I am. <laughs> and she says, Jim, you've squandered not just your money, but mine. And it's true, I have. <laughs> And she says, Jim, if you don't quit, I'll leave you or I'll kill you. Either one, maybe both. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, what are you doing out on a night like this, Judge? Just walking. Oh, you don't kid old Jim. Nobody picks a night like this to go just walking. Something's up, huh? Huh, Judge? Well, nothing you'd want to write about in the newspaper, darn it. You know, Judge, I need a story in the worst way. I'm up against a deadline. I don't even have tomorrow's column. How about an idea? Well, how about, uh, murder? Murder? Murder. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. Why not? Oh, because it's kind of offbeat, you know? Average person isn't concerned with murder. He doesn't doesn't think about killing. Oh, that's where you're wrong, Down Ed. Killing is the law of nature. Every living being has the mission to kill. Well, Judge, I wouldn't exactly say that. Oh, yes, everyone wants to kill. Animals kill ceaselessly every day in order to live. Birds constantly must kill. Well, yeah, but we're not exactly talking we about kill animals. Or we cause to be killed for our benefit. Well, I, it's, it's kind of a gruesome topic. You know, killing is almost... The same as creating, to make and to destroy. These concepts are the history of the universe. I, I, well, Judge, it's been great running into you, but I have some people down the line. To kill is the law. All right, if you say so, Because Judge. nature loves eternal youth. The more she destroys, the more she renews herself. Well, I wouldn't doubt that for a minute. Okay, I'll see you. Now, just a second. Huh? What is it? I want to show you something. Here, look. <gasps> Judge, what are you doing with a knife? We... Judge, let go of me. Are you crazy? Oh, no, 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 I'm not crazy. We kill animals, but that's not enough to satisfy Now, wait a minute. Long ago, the basic need was met by human sacrifice. But now, each man must... Help! Help! Quiet. I always treated you fairly, Judge. I always wrote good things about There's you. There's nothing personal in this. Please, Judge. please understand that. It has to be done. Judge. Don't struggle, Jim. It'll be over very quickly. Was he dead? 
I thought I heard someone coming. His scream may have been heard by someone, the police maybe. If he wasn't dead, I was doomed. But I didn't have time to make sure. I had to get out of there because I knew I had blood on my coat. I had to get out of there. And I had to get rid of that coat. Frank, where's your coat? Stu, I don't think you're going to believe me, but I, uh, I gave it away. You what? Yes, you, you know the legend of the rich man who gives his coat to a beggar? Well, I ran into some poor derelict, and I just oh, gave him... Oh, Frank. What a generous thing to do. Well, not really. The coat was getting old, and I was getting tired of it. And I never really liked it. Oh, uh, let me tell you the latest news. Mm-hmm. Jim Downard, mm-hmm. the uh, political columnist on the Herald. Yes, what about him? Well, he was found stabbed on the street. Oh, no. Uh-huh. Is, uh, is he dead? He's in a coma. Oh. He was unconscious when the police picked him up. Evidently, he'd been attacked. He'd been screaming for help. Well, uh, will he, uh, will he recover? Well, the police are convinced he'll be able to identify his attacker, but... Well, he has to regain consciousness. Yes. Yes. Uh, Estelle. Mm-hmm. I, I'd like to go to the hospital. I'd like to see him. Oh, I didn't know you were that close. Mr. Well, uh, Jim was, uh... He said he wanted to do a biography on me. Really? Mm-hmm. But you never said anything. Well, it was just in the talk stages. But well, they probably wouldn't permit visitors. Well, the least I can do is go there and ask if he needs blood. Oh, Frank... That's wonderful. The doctor said, sure, sure, he needs blood. And they took a pint of mine, which I thought was only fitting and proper. And then I asked if I could see Jim. And the doctor said Jim was still in a coma, but I could pop inside for a second. There was a cop stationed outside the door. He saluted me, and I walked into the room. He was lying very still. There were all kinds of tubes attached to various parts of his body. As I leaned over to look at him, he slowly opened his eyes. And I knew, I knew he was going to live, live and destroy me. Unless, unless I could do something. I could hear the doctor out in the hall. He was exchanging greetings with the policeman. Quickly, I pulled gently at one of the tubes in his arm. I didn't know what that might do, but it was all I had time for. You want some warm milk, honey? No, no, I'll uh, just go to bed. Uh, any news about Jim Downard? Sorry to have to tell you this, Frank, but came over the radio a few minutes ago. Jim Downard is dead. Oh. They said he never really had a chance. January 20th. I had discovered something else. In addition to the thrill of killing, there is also the exhilaration that is felt by the victim. Nature is kind. She also gives the one who is doomed the feeling of the drama. I know because for several hours last night, I could have been a victim. Had Jim Downard lived, well, it taught me a lesson. I should raise the stakes. I shouldn't be so invulnerable. After all, if I am absolutely 100% safe, where is the thrill? Morning, darling. Oh, I see you've prepared a big breakfast. You know, it seems to me that every time there's been a murder, you eat a big breakfast the following morning. Oh, how do you account for that? Well, how do you account for this? Police have suspect in Downard murder. Have they? Hmm. It's remarkable. It only happened late last night, and they have their man a few hours later. Darling, he's not exactly their man. He's just a suspect. Well, they don't say, but they hint pretty strongly that the evidence against him is rather heavy. Well, now, that's for a jury to decide. I don't know, Frank. I don't think he did it. Oh, no. Here we go again. Well, it's just a feeling. Darling, he'll have his day in court. Well, that doesn't necessarily prove anything. Estelle, are you attacking our system of justice? Did that poor kid, what's his name, uh, Peter Simmons, did, did he get justice? Well, he got a fair trial. Huh. 
Well, I still believe he's innocent. For all the good that does him now. And I believe this man is innocent, too. Estelle, you don't know what the evidence is. Well, it's is. just a feeling, and it... Well, it just won't go away. Oh, you're being silly. Maybe. I just wish that you weren't involved. Well, I have to be involved. It's my job. February 23rd. The man's name is Tom Lewis. 30 years old. He has a previous record. He did time for robbery and again for assault. I don't think his chances are too good. He doesn't have a very good story either. Well, I was just walking along down the street, see, and I, uh, I thought I heard somebody yell. Yell for help. So, 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 so I, I wasn't going mi- to get mixed up in it, see, but it was foggy. And I couldn't see, you know. And I, I guess I must have tripped over him. I could see he was dead, or good as dead. And there was blood. There was blood all over him. And that's how it got over me. And, and the money, well, all right, I figured as long as he's dead anyhow, he might have a couple of bucks on him. So I, 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 I reached into his pocket. Ah, uh, Your Honor, we should like the jury to examine this $50 bill. Listen, I'm not denying I took the money. Order, order. But somebody else had already knocked him off. The accused will remain seated and orderly. Well, I'm being framed. Mr. Lewis, I will not warn you again. The court cannot tolerate these outbursts. But I didn't kill him. February 25. I see now each of my murders has been a masterpiece. I feel like an artist. With this difference... I cannot accept credit for my work. Or perhaps the day will come when a man will be honored for a superlative job, such as I can do. Meanwhile, I'm not exactly being cheated. No one else wants to take credit for my work either. That's a consolation. Stell? Yes, Frank? Well, now, what are you doing sitting here in the dark? Is it dark? I hadn't noticed. Well, did you fall asleep? No. Well, let me turn on the light. There. That's better. Well, what a day. Did you hear about it on the news? No. Uh, the boy. He uh, isn't doing his case much good with all those outbursts. Would you like to go somewhere for dinner? I don't feel like eating out. Oh, well, that's all right. I just assume. The truth is, I don't feel like eating at all. What's wrong? That's a good question. How can I answer it? Just tell. I don't have the faintest idea of what to say or what to think. About what? About everything. Darling, I wish I knew what you were talking about. Well, there's really nothing I have to tell you. You're the one who has to tell me. I always tell you everything. I was paying the bills today. Oh, well, that's enough to get anybody down. And, um, I ran out of blank checks. Oh? I remembered... Yes? That, uh, that you always have an extra book of checks in your desk drawer. Oh. But you always keep it locked. Yes, that's right, I do. I thought, maybe this time... You might have left it open. Estelle, I never go through your things. We always respected each other's privacy. But the drawer just happened to be open. And I found this little book. And, uh, did you read it? Yes. Yes, Frank, I read it. Every single word of it. Did you tell anyone about it? No, Frank. I've told no one. Well, that's good. That's very good to know. Frank! How would you like to poke innocently through your husband's desk and come up with a diary like the one you've been listening to? Well, you could say she's twice foolish. First, to find the diary... And second, to let him know it. We'll let you know what happens when I return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78.
over the years, there's been a series of particularly brutal murders. You are the wife of a distinguished jurist who has presided over most of the trials and sent the supposedly guilty to death. Now, you find a diary in which your husband claims that he is the killer. Frank, what are you going to do? What do you mean, what am I going to do? Well, you, you kill those people. This, this boy... This one who's on trial now for the murder of Jim Downard. He's innocent. No, dear, he's guilty. But I just read your confession. And Peter Simmons, who was hanged for killing his sweetheart. Well, you... You admit you killed her. Darling, please sit down. You're becoming hysterical. That's right. That's right, I am. I... I have every right to become... Estelle, please, will you listen? But to what? To the truth. I've just read the truth. Darling, listen. For many years, I wanted to write a book. What? Now, will you please just listen? Uh, you don't have to say anything until I'm finished. I have been fascinated by the criminal mind. And so after a particularly brutal, apparently senseless murder is committed, I try to place myself in the mind of the killer. What does he think? The way you put it, murder is obedience to a natural law. That's poetic license, dear. What do you mean? We kill, not for gain. Oh, we think we do. We think we kill for money or for passion, but the truth is, these are just pretexts. <sighs> now, we kill because, because of an ancient urge. And when the urge becomes strong enough, we take advantage of any pretext that comes up. But I'm not aware of this uh, urge. And neither am I, dear. It's been refined and civilized out of us, but there are lower types. You see, the Tom Lewis's, but the Pete why? Simmons. Why what? I... Oh, I don't know. Estelle, do you believe that I killed these people? Well, there it was in your own handwriting. Oh, Estelle, Estelle, could you actually believe me capable of murder? I don't know. It was such a shock, and I... I was so frightened. Darling, darling, we've been married 20 years. Don't you know all there is to know about me? I thought I did. And then I... Well, I... I happen to remember certain things. I, like what? Well, each time there's been one of those murders, you... You just happen to be out walking. Well, there was such a thing as coincidence. And, and when that girl was killed... Well, you... You did have stains on your coat. Oh, darling... Would, would you hang me on circumstantial evidence? Well, you hung Peter Simmons on circumstantial evidence? And circumstantial evidence is tightening the noose around Tom Lewis's neck every day. Do you mean you seriously believe? <sighs> no. I believe you. Well, that's better. I believe you. Because I... I have no alternative. February 27. How could I have been so stupid? Why did I leave that drawer unlocked? I'm sure there are psychologists who would say that I want to be caught, but that's ridiculous. Does she believe me? Does she? Or... Do I have to... Kill her? Still. Now that. That would be testing the law, the natural law. Can you kill a loved one? Because I do love Estelle. That would be the highest obedience to the law to kill the one you love. Very well, Mr. Lewis. You expect this court to believe that you just stumbled across Mr. Downard's body in the dark? It. It's the truth. He had already been attacked by someone else. Yes. He was still alive. I... I... I think so. You insist you heard him cry for help. That's right, that's right. Someone had just attacked him, see? And he's the one who killed him. Yeah, but we don't know that he cried for help. All we have is your word for it. But it happened, I tell you, and... Uh, and... Yes? What? What did you want to say? Mr. Lewis, you must answer the prosecutor's question. What happened? Uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, you, well, well, it was foggy. But you see, just as I got there, I, uh, I, I, I saw somebody. You saw somebody? Right, right. I could see somebody running away. And could you describe that somebody? He was tall. Very tall. 
There's no mention of this somebody in any of your previous statements? Well, that's because I I, I was nervous. See, I couldn't think, but now... Yes? Well, well now, uh, as I go over it again and again in my mind, I remember. There was somebody, see, a tall guy, and he was running away. I mean, I can even remember his footsteps, his footsteps. And so now you expect us to believe that the murder was committed by a certain mysterious somebody. I expect you to believe the truth. I think we already know the truth. You heard about today's testimony, Estelle? Yes. He claims that a tall, mysterious stranger was running away from the scene. Yes, I know about it. I was uh, out walking that night. You were? And I'm tall. Exceptionally tall. Yes. And if you want to add to it, I came home without my coat. Now, why would I do that? To get rid of it. And why would I want to get rid of my coat? Because of the blood stains, naturally. Oh, please, Frank. How are we going to live with this, Estelle? You suspect me of being a killer. I never said You don't have to say. I can tell by your face, by the tone of your voice, you suspect me. I don't know. I don't know what to think. Well, if you think I'm a killer, shouldn't you want to stop me? How? Even if I believed it, who would believe me? I'm sorry, Estelle. I'm sorry for both of us. I should have never written a book like that, and you should never have read it. I don't know what kind of life we can have together. You'll never know the truth. But I I will, Frank, I will. I found a way to determine the truth. Well, how? How could you? The truth is in your diary. I read your diary very closely. And I found a way. I found a way. Who are you? That's not important, Tom Lewis. How'd you get in here? It wasn't easy. Now, what do you want? I want to save you. <laughs> yeah, why? Listen, I pulled a lot of wires to get into this prison. I'm the only chance you've got. Who are you kidding? I got no chance at all. Unless you can work a miracle. How are you at uh, miracles, huh, lady? Just pull yourself together. You have a job to do. Now, look, lady, I don't know who you are, what you want, but it ain't going to work. You have absolutely nothing to lose. Now, just tell me, was there or was there not a tall man who ran away as you approached? Yeah, yeah, I told the prosecutor. Now, you, you just didn't make that up in the desperate hope someone might believe it. Lady, I don't have to lie. I got nothing to lose. There was someone. Tall? Yeah. Yeah, tall guy. And that's all you could say about him? Well, he was tall and kind of athletic looking, you know. Good build, and he moved. He moved fast. I see. <laughs> hey, lady. <laughs> hey, what's the matter? Come on, what are you crying about? Oh, nothing, nothing at all. Now, do you want to be cleared of the murder charge? Huh. Just like that, huh? Well, almost. Why should I be cleared? Because tomorrow you'll stand up in court and admit you killed, uh, admit you killed Jim Downard. Oh, great. And that's going to clear me? Yes. Oh, lady, why don't you leave me alone, huh? I got it tough enough now. Do as I tell you. You mean you want me to just jump up and holler, I killed him, I killed yes, him? Yes, and then you'll go on and... And this is what else you'll tell them. And so, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've heard all the testimony, seen all the evidence, and now it's up to you to decide whether the accused, Tom Lewis is guilty as charged of the crime of murder. They don't have to decide. There will be order in this court. Order. I mean, what's to decide? I'm guilty. Hey, hear what he said. Order. Order. The prisoner will be seated. I'm guilty. Guilty, you see? I don't care what those clowns on the jury think. I killed him. I killed Jim Donard. I killed him, and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. Sure, sure, I killed him. What's wrong with that? Everybody killed sooner or later. We're all killers, you see? I killed him because I couldn't help myself. I said be seated. Didn't you ever want to kill somebody, Judge, huh? Didn't you? I'll have you removed from this court. What do I care? I killed him. 
And I also killed that woman last year, you know? That Darlene, right? Darlene, what's her name? I killed her, and her boyfriend swung for it. You did not. I did. I did. I can still feel the, the wild beating of her heart, you see? The hysterical pounding of her pulse. And then you stab. You stab with a knife. You didn't kill her. I killed her. And I killed Tom Downard. You can't take that away from me. Don't anybody try to take it away from me. Silence. I won't be silent. I killed because I had to. I had to obey the law. The natural law. Nature commanded me to kill. That's a lie. You're a cheap little punk. What would you know about nature's laws? What would an ignorant hoodlum like you know about nature's law? What would an illiterate clod like you know about the dark hidden places in the human soul? What would you know about the bloody imperatives of the race? I know. I killed both of them. You're a liar. You didn't kill anybody. I did. I killed Darlene Wilson, and I killed Jim Donnett, and I can prove it. Right. Now, oh. now, you, now you know, Estelle, now you know I did it. And they weren't cheap little crimes of passion. They were obedience to the elemental law. You know that's the truth, Estelle. Show them the book. Show everybody the book. They were all set to throw the book at ex-judge Frank Wallace, but, of course, the plea was insanity. And if it proves anything at all, it demonstrates that no one should try to steal credit from a true artist. No one else should ever try to pose as the author of his works, even if those works are concerned with murder. I'll be back shortly. heard them say, murder will out. It's supposed to mean that murder cannot be hidden. The fact will eventually emerge. However, the tale you just heard adds a chilling dimension to that statement. It can now mean that murder may slumber deep inside each of us and that one day it may find its way out. No, no, that won't do. Better enjoy murder vicariously with us. That way, you'll never be tempted or driven. Our cast included Larry Haynes, E.V. Juster, Robert Dryden, and William Redfield. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. In a sense, he's still alive. Medically, he, he's dead. It's only a matter of time till the rest of him dies, too. And I am the one to live. Yes. You will live. My hands. How bad are they? Well, when the wagon ran over them, the, the right one was severed, was moribund, devoid of all life by the time you were brought here. And the other? Crushed beyond hope. Why wasn't I the one to die? can never play the piano again. There is one way you could. How? If I gave you Rudy Baum's hands. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the terrifying world of your imagination. What would you say is the one single feature that distinguishes man from all his fellow creatures? His brain? Speech? His ability to walk erect? The fact that he's the only living thing that kills for any other reason than self-defense or food? None of them. Something much more simple. A phenomenon shared only by our cousins, the apes. The human hand. This is a gripping, eerie story of a pair of... Uh, how best to describe them? Superhuman? Unique? N no. Perhaps best. A pair of immortal hands. What time is it? Four o'clock, Doctor. Over seven hours. My fingers are numb, Helga. May I finish the sutures for you, Herr Doctor? Yeah, speed is very important. Morphine is beginning to wear off. Dare I drug him again? Oh, absolutely not. Young, healthy as he is, we could kill him. Here, you take the needle so carefully. These hands must still be able to make the greatest music in all Vienna, in all the civilized world. If the graft holds... Though I fly in the face of the Almighty, I have done what I have done. Dear God, may my gamble succeed and be forgiven. Our mystery drama, Death by Whose Hands, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Stefan Schnabel, and Robert Drivis. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In the beginning of the 19th century, no city in Europe shone more brightly or boasted a more resplendent culture than Vienna. City of dreams, of glittering balls, of royalty and nobility and beautiful women. But most of all, of music. Music to the Viennese was, and is, a religion, a faith, a passion. And passion is an insidious, destructive emotion which can lead to sinister and deadly results. You are listening at the moment to the hands of Rudy Baum on the piano in Vienna's great concert hall. I have nothing left. My hands are too tired. Quite right, my boy. You must not strain them at any cost. Let's go to my dressing room. Rudy, Papa and I want to take you straight home to supper. Oh, I must go to my room at the university and change first. I am ringing wet. Oh, the touch of your hands. <laughs> From the whisper of Mozart to the thunder of Beethoven. <laughs> oh, we must protect those hands as a doctor and your future father-in-law. I will make that my business. <laughs> well, I intend to be a little part of that legend, you see. Magnificent, Rudy. Du hast wirklich glänzend gespielt. Yes, you were at your best, my friend. It was a remarkable debut. Remarkable? It was a succès fou, beyond our wildest dreams. Beyond mine, I must admit. Rudy, I'll drive you back to the university. No, we, 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 we can drive, Rudy. But, Papa, there won't be room for five in the carriage. Five? Well, you and I, Helga, Rudy, and Franz. You are coming to our little supper and celebration, aren't you, Franz? I wasn't sure I was invited. Rudy's best friend and fellow pianist. But, of course. <laughs> then I accept. I'll go and fetch my hat and cape. Yeah, Ilse and I will go with you. <laughs> there will be important people coming backstage. Uh, you won't mind waiting a while, huh? Hell down, Trump. Naturally, please. We'll try not to be too long. You didn't answer the head, Dr. Franz. Did I have any other choice than to remain and cool my heels? 
I think my friend tonight, your nose, is, is a little out of joint. Why do you say that? <laughs> Listen to them. Can you hope to match it at your debut? That remains to be seen. I think I'll wait outside. It's uncomfortably hot in here. Oh. <laughs> Only for other pianists, I'm afraid, Franz Langemann. Big night for you, Rudy. No, it's only the beginning. I'm sure of that. Oh, but you're right. It is a big night. It's the start of everything I've worked and slaved for all my life. You wouldn't understand. Why not? Haven't I done the same? You. <laughs> How could you know what I've suffered? You started with everything. I with nothing. I'm poor. I'm short. If I'm not downright ugly, at least I'm... No tall, handsome, elegant dandy like you. <laughs> but I've got it all in these hands of mine now. I've got the girl. I've got her father as patron. And soon I'll have all the rest. The money, the fame, the clothes. I've beaten you, Franz. I've beaten you. And I did it all with my talent, with these. All right, Rudy. All right. You've had a great success, but don't let it go to your head. You're not the only pianist in Vienna. Oh, yes, I am now. Well, some of your classmates still have to make their debuts. <laughs> Who? Gelbach? No technique. Struck? Is here. Made of tin. Rangel? He's all thumbs. And me? You. You are nothing. You've no tone. You're wooden. You're stiff. You play like a music box. I ought to stop this carriage right now and throw you out. Go ahead. We're almost there. No, I'll do you this one last favor. We'll get there as fast as I can so I can get rid of you for good. Get up. Hey, look out, friends. The streets are icy. It's your big night. I'm only giving you something else to thrill about. There's a curve ahead. And that wagon has stopped blocking the road. Friends, look out. Look out. Get this oh, oh, carriage. It's <laughs> ah! What on earth do you suppose is keeping Rudy so late? Oh, so impatient to announce the engagement, huh? Well, of course. Why not? Uh, it's not easy to be the wife of a man who belongs to the public. Oh, but I can't wait to be married to Rudy. To travel with him everywhere. To be feted by the great. To have kings and queens lavish praise and honor on us. <laughs> uh, there isn't much warmth in the light from reflected glory. What warms a woman is love. Oh, really, Papa? I'm getting exactly what I want. But I do wish... Science, you... bitte. Für science. What, what is it, Helga? What is it? Uh, uh, bitte, Herr Doctor, may I see you alone? No, I want to hear also. There is an inspector of police downstairs. Police? There's been an accident. We are both needed at the infirmary. An accident? To whom? I don't know how but Speak to... up, speak up. If it concerns Ilda, she'll have to know sooner or later. Herr Langemann's light carriage collided with a heavy wagon. Franz has been badly hurt. And Rudy? Were his hands injured? No. He... he has a concussion only. Well, we'll go immediately. Is he conscious? No. Oh, I... Catch her, Helga. No, no, <sighs> I, I'm... I'm all right. I'm not going to faint. I'm going with you to the infirmary. <laughs> The hemorrhage is so massive. Brain destruction is irreversible. I'm surprised Rudy's still breathing. Oh, the music these hands made less than three hours ago. The music they could have continued to make. All vanished. Oh, what a loss. What an irreparable loss to the world. And to your daughter. Oh, yes, Ilse. I, I, I cannot face her now, Helga. Will you, old friend? Trust me. I'll take her home and sedate her. No, no, no. Give her something here before she leaves. Uh, the inspector can see her home. I, uh, I need you here. As you wish. But she'll want to see you, Rudy. What do I tell her? Well, tell her, tell her, tell her. She, she must wait. Uh, don't hold out any hope. And Franz? Well, I'm going to see him now. Uh, tell Ilza he had some, uh, some hand injuries. 
Say he's under sedation. And be sure that policeman takes Ilza home. He's asked all he needs to know. It's all right here, doctor. I'm awake. Yes, so I see. How is Rudy? Rudy is uh, uh, asleep. Uh, are you in pain? No, the morphine does that. I, I deserve it anyway. Why? It was my fault. He was so swelled with his success, he blurted out the truth. He's been using all of us. Me, you, Wilsa. He informed me he had no use for me anymore. Of course, he still needs you and Ilse. Oh, I... I don't know why I'm even saying this, mine hair. I... Rudy has no need of any of us anymore. You said he was a... He's dead. He might as well be. And what does that mean? His skull was fractured. He has had massive intracranial bleeding. His brain is damaged beyond repair. In a sense, he's still alive. Medically, he, he's dead. It's only a matter of time till the rest of him dies, too. And I am the one to live. Yes. You will live. My hands, how bad are they? When the wagon ran over them, the, the right one was severed, was moribund, devoid of all life by the time you were brought here. And the other? Crushed beyond hope. If it can be saved from amputation, at best it will be a withered, motionless claw. Oh, why wasn't I the one to die? I, I, I can never play the piano again. There is one way you could. How? If I gave you... Rudy Baum's hands. In stunned, incredulous shock, Franz stares up at the usually kind and humorous face of the Herr Dr. Herschel. Now it is stern and drained, the eyes boring down at the young man, gleaming with a strange fanaticism. What he is proposing is beyond belief, beyond possibility, beyond the laws of man and God. I'll return shortly with Act Two. And now back to CBS Radio Mystery Theater. The year is 1804. Vaccination has been discovered eight years before, but anesthesia will not even be conceived of till 1842. The only antidotes against pain are alcohol, opium, and a man's determination. And Franz Langemann lies in a bed in Dr. Herschel's private infirmary facing a transplant infinitely more complicated than anything medicine has dreamed of today. Rudy's hands... But he's still not dead. Well, the moment his heart stops to beat, we can take them. Still alive and pulsing. Could it work? Could I use them as hands? I don't know, Franz. I know only you have nothing to lose. If the transplant fails, you will be no worse off than you are now. And if it succeeds? If it succeeds? You're a musician. What better tools could you have to create beauty in music than the fingers and the hands of Rudy Baum? Very well. If Rudy is gone, I agree. Johan, put the horses away. Uh, I'll sleep till mid-afternoon. I will need you before then. Papa! Oh, Ilse. Well, what are you doing up so early? Early? It's almost nine o'clock. How is Rudy? Oh, what can I say, Liebchen? 
To make it easy for you. He's... dead. I knew it. He's dead. Yes. Ilza, I... It's all right, uh... Papa. When you were so long, I... knew. And Franz... Franz is, uh... He will live. He's fine. What about his hands? Well, that's what, uh... What kept me so long. Helga and I were, uh... Were operating on them. Well, will he have the use of them again? Uh, I hope a great deal more than that. He might even be able to play again? Well, it's too soon to know anything. It'll, it'll take months. Oh, what's the difference? It won't be Rudy. Nobody ever will play like Rudy Baum again. Not in your lifetime, Papa. Or in mine. Well, it would seem too much to hope for, would it not, meine Tochter? And yet... I am going to dare to hope. A week now and no sign of gangrene? Yes. Yes, there seems to be circulation in all the fingers. But no uh, sensation yet. The nerves need time to regenerate. So... Now, Franz, we are taking off some of the bandages to, to free the fingers. Yes, Doctor. Now, Franz, uh, which hand am I touching? I... I don't know. I don't know. I, I have no hands. It isn't working. Patience, patience. Well, we try something else. Move your right thumb... All right. I'll try the left. Ah, it moved. It moved. So, we make a beginning. Uh, now we try the other fingers one by one. And as you see, today we take all the bandages off for good. These terrible scars. No, no, not terrible. Beautiful. Well, you will see within a year there will be thin white lines you can hardly detect. Besides, I made the grafts far enough back so that your linen will cover them at all times. Even when you play. You really expect that I will ever play the piano again? I hope. I hope with all my heart. Now we try the exercises again. Here, pick up the pencil. I can't. I, I can't feel the damn thing. The feeling will come. No, never. They work, they move, but they have no feeling. I tell you, it's all been for nothing. I'm wearing a dead man's hands. Good morning, Franz. Morgen, lieber Herr Doctor. How do you feel today? Oh, I haven't had any pain in them for the last two or three days. Well, the first part is over. We are going home. Home. I will not go back to the Schloss. It is too big, and with my family gone... Of course, of course you don't return to the castle. <laughs> You're coming home with us. Ach, no, my dear, I cannot impose on your hospitality. I insist. You are my patient, you are my protégé, and my... Prodigy. <laughs> Besides, you still need care and supervision for your exercises. Yes, at home we will have a new teacher for you. Who? Ilse. Helga has been training her to assist with your rehabilitation. Does, does Ilse know about, about the hands? No. No one knows that secret. Save you and I and Helga. No one has ever know. As far as the world is concerned, and you, Franz, these are your hands. You must think of them from now on, every moment, waking or sleeping, as, as your hands. Yours. But they are not. They are Rudy Bombs. Rudy Bomb is dead. Come, let us go home. I have some uh, special bandages that you will wear always. 
Ah, uh, come. Ilse is waiting to see you eagerly. Ilse? To see me? Well, I will tell you a secret, and uh, then we shall never mention it again. Uh, I believe sincerely that it was not Rudy my daughter loved. She was just blinded and bewitched by his uh, talent. I can be truthful when I say she mourns him no longer. Well, aren't you anxious to see her? Ilse? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go home. Guten Tag, Franz. Ilse, I didn't hear you come in. Guten Tag. Where is Papa? He went back to the infirmary after lunch. Oh, I thought you and he were together. And now that I'm here, I must take up my duties. Will you come to the table? Are we to eat again? No. We're going to start your exercises. Oh. Your poor hands. To think. That night, Papa never told me how badly they were injured. There's not a sign of a scar. Your father is a magician. <laughs> I know he's prouder of his success with you than anything he's ever done. Do they still hurt? No. Even when I hold them? My hands are not what you heard, Ilsa. It was my heart that was in your hands. Oh, that was a long time ago, Franz. It's over. Shall we start again, then? Us? Again? No, I meant the exercises. <laughs> What are you doing here in the music room? Ilse, suddenly, 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 yes. I feel that my hands may be ready to try again. Then try it. Ilse, uh, forgive me. I know you will understand. I, I, I want to be alone in the house. I, I want no one to hear me until I'm ready. If that is what you wish, Liebling. Liebling? Oh, that... That was a slip of the tongue. I'll take it as that. For now. But if... Uh, is it... Will you help me in a plan I have? Ask me. Well, your father's birthday is two months away. I, I want to repay him for all he's done for me in a way beyond money. Uh, let me have four hours a day. Alone. Here. No one but the servants in the house and swear them to silence. Let the hair doctor think I'm taking my regular exercises to strengthen my hands. Instead, let me exercise them where they belong. On the keyboard. Oh, that's marvelous. If only I... Only what? No, oh, if, if only I could share it with you. No one can share this private agony. Liebchen, yes, I, I, I will call you that, and I hope that I have the right to. But I won't know for at least two months. Help me. In everything. Always. Yes. Oh, darling. Darling. <laughs> and that was not a slip of the tongue. I'll be out of the house in ten minutes, and you can start to build your triumph alone. <laughs> A dinner fit for a king and a birthday cake made for an emperor. <laughs> I had forgotten it was my birthday, but then that's, <laughs> that's easy to do at my age. We'll have a port and brandy and coffee in the music room. Music room? Why there? Now, don't ask questions, Papa. On a birthday, there are many surprises. There's one very special gift you haven't received yet. From France. Oh, I don't need any, any gifts. This one, permit me to offer you. Ilse? Thank you, Franz. Liebe Doctor. Oh, danke schön. Now sit with me, Papa. Here on the sofa. Oh, this is all so, so mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> what are you up to? Shh, listen. Liebe Herr Doctor Herschel und mein Liebchen Ilse, this is a moment of terrifying truth. I am Lazarus, but am I surely risen from the dead? For all of us, music is a way of life. 
If it is still mine, then this is the best birthday gift I can offer either of you. In return for all you've done for me. Here it is. It was magnificent. I've never heard it played better. To live. <laughs> to live for moments like these. Oh, Franz, Franz, how can I thank you? <laughs> but this is not just for me. You, you will concertize. Oh, of course. He's going to set the world on fire. And that's the other birthday present we have for you, Papa. What? More? More? Franz is not only your prodigy. He's going to be your son. We're going to be married. Oh, at last, at last. Well, this is not my birthday. It's, it's the beginning of the world. Good night, Ilse. Must you go? Time enough for us. This is his celebration. Let us wait for ours. If I must. Don't tempt me. You were so wonderful tonight. The tone, your hands. All of me is yours. Then come. Come to bed. Ilse. Oh, how sweet you sleep. Your hand in mine. My hands. What? Who stole my hands? Goody. You, Franz. You stole them. No. No, Rudy. No. Try to use them, Franz. Try to borrow my talent. Try to win the world and grasp it in your hands. Only you won't. Never. 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 You are nothing except for my hands. And they will never belong you. Ilsa, so sure of her future at last, turns lazily in her sleep. She has no intimation of the restless dreams that are torturing her intended husband. And neither of them is aware of the nervous tensing and extension of the hands that once were Rudy Baum's. Hands joined to the body of Franz Langemann. I'll return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. The debut that fall of Franz Langemann was sensational. The public took him to their hearts. And the critics were unanimous in praise, projecting for him the brilliant future that had been denied Rudy Baum by his untimely death. So bright, indeed, were all Franz Langemann's prospects that he seemed to have banished the tortured dreams that haunted his sleep. Till the morning of his wedding day, he was standing before the pier glass, adjusting his white cravat when... Rudy! <laughs> no. Don't turn around, Franz. You won't find me in the room. Here. In the mirror. Why are you here? What is it you want? Everything that was mine. Ilsa. My career. My hands. I cannot give any of it back. You will give me all of it back, Franz. All that is mine. Look. 
Look how they buried me. Two bleeding wrists. My hands torn from my arms. You might as well have opened my chest and ripped my heart from its moorings. But I will have my revenge. You're dead. Not till I am whole. I can never rest until I am whole. Stay back! Stay back! God help me! Franz? Franz, are you all right? Franz, what happened? I, I, I seem to have smashed the pier glass with a chair. But why? Here, doctor, I, 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 I cannot marry Ilse. We, we will have to call the wedding off. <sighs> Guests are already arriving. Ilse is dressed in her bridal gown. What's the matter, boy? Are you mad? More than a little, I'm afraid. I, I can guess perhaps what troubles you. Uh, let us sit down together then and, and talk this over. So Rudy has been haunting your dreams, and now today his specter appeared in the mirror. Yes. And you feel that uh, his uneasy spirit is doomed to haunt you, that his ghost will forever dog your footsteps? Yes. Certainly if I marry Ilse. And I love her too much to put her through that, too. Franz, you are an exceptionally kind and sensitive man. You've been through an agonizing and traumatic experience. You have been driving yourself, practicing long hours for your concert debut. You are exhausted physically and emotionally. The mind is simply playing you tricks. No, you don't understand. Rudy Baum was no friend of mine. You remember? I tried to tell you that night, the night of the accident. Oh, yeah, yeah, so you did, I recall. Rudy was my enemy. He resented me, hated me. The night of his triumph, when he had everything, he gloated over it. He threw it in my teeth. Well, then, that is it, Franz. <laughs> Why should you have any remorse? You think it is only remorse that conjures up these visions? Of course. That and your oversensitive nature. When I can help there, I will give you some milder sedation for the days. And for the nights. <laughs> if you need it. <laughs> I should think uh, Ilse would be better than all my pills for that. <laughs> what you need is her to take care of you. Ilse, Franz, welcome home. Oh, Papa, it's good to be back. It's good to see you here, Doctor. So, now, tell me all about the tour. It was brilliant, marvelous, unbelievable. Standing ovations everywhere. <laughs> France was the lion of the hour. He looks like a rather tired lion. Oh, just need a couple of days rest. I must look a fright after that long carriage ride. You'll excuse me while I change. Oh, I forgot. We are to give a special concert recital for the Emperor at Schönbrunn. Imagine our own emperor. Well, oh, she is wildly happy. Yes, Ilse thrives on all the social life. Well, you don't seem to share her enthusiasm. Oh, my God, how can I? Oh, come on, France. Not so bad to be wined and dined. The important thing is to remember it's a tribute to your genius. My genius. Do you really think it is I they applaud? Well, who else? These, these, that's what they come to worship. And who makes them work? Not I. I tell you, they have a life of their own. Do you think I could attack the Beethoven Emperor as though notes exploded from one of Napoleon's cannons? I tell you, they are beyond my control, and it is driving me mad. I want to play my own music, be my own man. These may be the hands of a genius, but... Lord, help me, they are not mine. I never want to play the piano again. Franz? Yes, Ilse. What are you doing out of bed? Thinking. Well, must you sit by the window, come back to bed, and think with me? I'm afraid in bed with you, Ilse, I don't think very clearly. <laughs> It's better when you don't think at all. That used to be a way out. 
No longer. What do you mean? Ilse, listen to me. I don't want to play again. Are you out of your mind? The king, the queen, Napoleon and the Empress Josephine. Are they so the... important to you? Well, what are you trying to say? Are they more important to you than my peace of soul? Now, really, Franz, you should live to play. Why? Because it's expected of you. By whom? Well, by uh, the nobility, royalty, uh, everyone who hears your music. And you? Yes, and my father. Oh, no. Your father understands. And for the rest, there's always a new artist, a new interest. The truth is, isn't it, that I must keep on playing for you? Well, that isn't true. Then, if you love me, agree that my career is over. Would you love me still, just as Franz Langemann? You're being foolish, Liebling. This is just another temperamental display. Why should you stop playing? I won't allow you to. Won't you, Ilse? I think it's time we put things to a test. What are you doing? I want to show you something. I don't think I want to see it. At last you must. Mm. You see my arms? Why do you think I wear these bandages above my wrists? Well, you, you always said the scars were ugly and... It, it, <laughs> ugly? Let me show you the truth. Look at both arms. Why? There's nothing there but... but a thin white line. On each arm, all the way around. See? Yes, but... but I thought... In the accident, Rudy's brain was injured fatally, but the rest of him was untouched. All of me was untouched except my hands. They were completely destroyed. But if they were... If they were... Oh, oh no. Yes, Ilse. Oh, no. Yes, yes, these are Rudy's hands, grafted to me miraculously by your surgeon father. No. These are what you love, aren't they? Not me. I... I... I Even when they were still Rudy's, it was these hands and the fame and the notoriety and the acclaim that could win and really claim your love. The man behind them meant little except a means to an end. Oh, right. No, I... I, I Franz, I, No. I, I give you one last choice, Ilse. Rudy can never play again. And promise you I never will. But you stay with me as my wife. And care for me and nourish me. Now I know you're mad. And I'll not waste my life on you. I forced myself to endure Rudy because I knew he could carry me with him to the top. I found you more endurable if you could give me the same. But if you turn your back on success and glory, don't ask me to do the same. You cannot love me for myself. Only for these. With those hands. No matter whose. You can rule the world. Even though they destroy me. Oh, I don't know why I wasted my time on such a fool. Those hands are not for destruction. Even about your throat. Say you love me. Oh, stop being a child, son. Say you love me. At this moment, I despise you. Now, watch. What? What? Well, the new pier glass I brought today, you're going to knock it over. She fooled us both, Fran. Kill her. They're my hands. What are you looking at? Can't you see him? Rudy. In the mirror. You're mad. Franz, no. No. <laughs> You said to use them, Rudy. They're not mine. Not mine. Yours. Oh, now what is there to do? Police will come, Franz. You will be hanged. What does it matter? Well, nothing can bring Rudy or... Oh, my daughter back. Well, I was as guilty as anyone in this. I wanted to save a, a rare musical gift for the world. And I was tempted in the operation to, to play God. And now there's only one thing to do. What? Uh, poor Ilza must have fought. Your face is, is, is damaged. Now we must ransack the apartment. Well, I will take enough valuables away with me. Then, 
that I will say I, I came to visit you and that I found my daughter and you and then that I rushed out for, for the police. Frank. Frank. What is it? Look in the glass. Rudy. Did you really think I'd let you escape? Do you really think I care anymore? Take my hand and put them around your throat. That's it. Now, let me do the rest. So I came to visit my daughter and her husband and, and found them, as you see. My daughter is dead. My, my son-in-law merely rendered unconscious. I, I placed him on the bed, as you see, and, and uh, came for you, Inspector. Murder and robbery, obviously. Uh, I don't know how much is missing. Uh, certainly my daughter's jewels, some ivory pieces I gave them as a wedding present. Your daughter is quite dead, strangled. How is the young man? Oh, some facial wounds. Possible concussion. And, uh... <clears throat> what is it here, Doctor? Franz! Franz, he has been strangled, too! Tongue protruding, face livid, marks on throat. Not much doubt. Some kind of maniac, it looks. <gasps> Good Mimel. What is it? A maniac, all right. Look. Cut right off above the wrist. He has no hands. <laughs> I wonder if anyone stopped to exhume Rudy Baum from his solitary grave. Would he prove to have hands or not? As it happened, no one did. And since Herr Dr. Herschel died quite suddenly from a heart attack during the solemn requiem mass for his daughter and his son-in-law, why should it have occurred to anyone to question this extraordinary tale further? I'll be back shortly. One comment in closing. Man proposes, God disposes. There is never a time when man can take his work into his hand. No truer words have been spoken than in the Bible, Hosea 8, chapter 7. They have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. Our cast included Robert Drivas, Stefan Schnabel, Marion Seldes, Ira Lewis, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Florence would never give me a divorce. And even if she did, she'd want a big alimony. And I, I just couldn't afford you, Sherry. Well, I won't deny I'm expensive. But you could easily afford me. How? Cy Mercer and his new lady love are leaving early for a weekend in Bermuda. Monday's a holiday. They won't be back till Tuesday morning. It won't be till then that they discover the money is missing. What money? The money in the teller's drawers. How much do you think it adds up to? Well, it's the end of the month. Payday for most people... The deposits have been heavy, somewhere between six or seven hundred thousand dollars. Why? Uh, what do you want to know? I just wanted to know how much we're going to steal. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams.
come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. The fear you can hear. This is the story of a natural-born loser. Within the quietest and most retiring of the genus Homo sapiens, there lurks a tiger. As indeed, it lurks in all of us. It takes only the right combination of intolerable pressures, unfulfilled dreams, and the opportunity to escape the first and realize the second to make even the worm turn, which is just what happened to Henry Green. I do a lot of dreaming. When you're married to someone like Florence, you've got to do something. But I never figured any of those dreams to come true. Revenge dreams, you know, like... It is the decision of this court that you, Florence Green, be removed to a suitable place and hang by the neck until you are dead. Maybe it's hung. I never remember her like... It's all right, Dr. Willoughby. I know you did your best to pull her through, but it's God's will that prevails in the end. Florence is gone forever. Someone yaks at you like Florence and steps on your toes everything you want to do and has to be on you every moment and won't let you out of the house alone. I'm telling you, it's simply murder. So I dream a lot about my wife just not being. But I never thought of actually causing her not to be. I never really meant to end up a murderer. <laughs> Our mystery drama, It's Simply Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Jack Guilford. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. One of the simplest and most fiendish devices to drive men mad is the Chinese water torture. The slow drip of water, second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour on the forehead. Unending, inescapable, inexorable. Henry Green's life was like that, both in his work and at home. Did you wash up all your breakfast dishes? Yes, Florence. You left the spoons up so they drain? Yes. Put out the garbage? Yes. And you cleaned out the sink? Yes, Florence. You wrung out the sponge? Yes, look, I just... Don't you move until I'm finished talking to you. Now, look, I want you right straight home here after the bank closes tonight. Well, some of the boys... Oh, don't give me any, uh, some of the boys. But just a drink to say bon voyage. But you'll have all the bon voyage on the cruise when we leave tomorrow. Although, don't think there'll be any drinking going on there either. There's enough money being spent on this vacation now. It's the first real vacation we've taken since our honeymoon. And we wouldn't and be having it if I hadn't made you save for it. I didn't start saving the money for the cruise. I, I know, I know. You wanted to save it for a smelly, dangerous, noisy old motorcycle. Well, I wasn't having any of that. I, I always wanted one all my life. Oh, stop I... it. You're too old for one now anyway. How do you know what? What I, was that? I, I, I said, n now, do you know that I've, I've got to leave or I'll be late for the bank? Well, don't forget to pick up the suitcase. What suitcase? Your old one that Travis Luggage is repairing. Oh, all right. And mine to come right home after... Ooh, watch out for the cat! Ouch! Ouch! You clumsy fool, you stepped on him. I didn't. He tried to run out of the door and he bit me. Serves you right. He knows you don't like him. <laughs> Once I left the house, I always tried to put Florence out of my mind. And the best way to do that was to think about Sherry Woods. Not that I could do any more than think about her, because she was Mr. Mercer's day and night, if you know what I mean. But more and more, I guess I was getting to the dangerous age, because I sure did a lot of thinking about Sherry. That's 10, 20, 
30, 35, 40, 45, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 makes 50. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Uh, See you next week. You haven't any more customers, Henry. Close your window. Why, Sherry? Mr. Mercer wants to see me? I want to see you. Meet me in the conference room. Of course, if you say so, but what's wrong? Everything, as far as we're concerned. Unless maybe we have the nerve to try to put it right. Anyway, it's something we can't talk over here. Meet me where I sat. What kept you so long? Uh, Mr. Mercy, he stopped me. You still think I'm attractive? Well, Sherry, knowing how I felt for you all this time, you have to ask? Yeah, I want to be quite sure. Come here, Henry. Where? Here. Right close against me. Put your arms around me. Suppose someone should come in. I slipped the automatic lock on the door before you came in. We're quite safe. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel that way. I meant from being interrupted. Now kiss me. Sherry, I'm a married man. Oh, don't tell me you don't want to. Sherry, you, you could make me do anything but... Oh, make me do anything. All right, all right, that's enough. Oh, I, I never kissed anyone like this. It's a good thing, you'd be arrested. It, it'd be worth it. Let's do it again. Well, we could do it forever, if you wanted to. But I'm married. Well, we could make a few changes. Henry, when you get back from your trip, are you still expected to be... Promoted. Well, I... Mr. Mercer has practically promised me... Don't forget Sam Mercer's promises. I ought to know how little they're worth. We, my darling, are out. My darling? Did you hear the other part? What do you mean, we're out? You know in your heart, you'll never be vice president. And I've been fired. He can't do that to you. Well, he already has. You mean, Mr. Mercer has, uh, uh... Changed his affections? I mean, that lousy, pot-bellied little two-timer has gone right off the deep end for Miss Fancy Pants. Gosh, Sherry, I am sorry. If there's anything I can do... Henry, love, there's plenty you can do to help. You and me are going to be rich. Together. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Look, I, I better get back to my cage. Is that where you think you belong? Well, I am head teller and... In a cage? Oh, you're a man, not a mouse. Now's the time for you to prove it. Grab the world by the tail. How'd you like to travel the world, live like royalty, never have to punch a time clock, get away from handling other people's money, have it be your own? Both of us. Just, just you and me. Just uh, us? But, 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 Sherry, I mean, if, even if, if there wasn't Florence, I don't have any money. She's got it all. Oh, then that settles it. I'm going to remake your life. How? Well, why don't we have lunch together, and I'll tell you. Where? The sandwich shop? No. Let's make it the gourmet. At 12.30? But that's terribly expensive. Oh, Henry, love, that's the way you and me are going from here on in. If you go along with me. You know, I want to, but... But how? I'll tell you that. After the second martini. I don't think I've ever had two martinis in a row. Certainly not in the middle of the day. Well, that's the whole trouble with you, Henry. You haven't really lived. That's because I haven't wanted to. Well, if you really want, you gotta take. I guess we both learned that today. We sure did. The boat sailed for both of us. Yeah, well, there's another boat sailing tomorrow that I'm more interested in. It's the one I wish I was taking with you. Oh, but what could I do with Florence? Yeah, well, that's what we're gonna discuss. We are? Mm. The best way to get rid of your wife. It's what we both want, isn't it? Florence would never give me a divorce. And even if she did, 
She'd won a big alimony, and I... I just couldn't afford you, Sherry. Well, I won't deny I'm expensive, but you could easily afford me. How? Cy Mercer and his new lady love are leaving early for a weekend in Bermuda. Monday's a holiday. They won't be back till Tuesday morning. It won't be till then that they discover the money is missing. What money? The money in the teller's drawers. How much do you think it adds up to? Well, it's the end of the month. Payday for most people. The deposits have been heavy, somewhere between six or seven hundred thousand dollars. Why? Uh, what do you want to know? I just wanted to know how much we're going to steal. Shh. All right, dear. No one's listening to us. I'm not listening to you. You must be mad. Steal it for what? For us to enjoy the rest of our life together. Together? What about Florence? Yeah. What about Florence? I just can't wish her dead, you know. Well, I don't see why not. You... You mean... Kill her? How many times have you wanted to? Almost every day of... <laughs> but that's different. I, I would never do anything about it. Not even for me? It, it, it isn't that. I, I, I wouldn't know how. Anyway, it's all impossible. Why? But it takes two keys to close and open the teller's vault. Mine and Mr. Mercer's. Oh, you mean this one? How did you... Well, I told you he was leaving early. He gave me his key to close the vault tonight with Mr. Schaefer. But Schaefer doesn't have the other key I have. Yeah, but Cy thinks Schaefer's going to have it because he's instructed me to tell you to give it to Schaefer and tell him we'd be locking up while you're gone. So we have full access to the money. Yeah, until the outer door is closed with the time lock. And then the vault can't be opened until Tuesday. But I'd be trapped on the ship out at sea, and then I... Henry, after you've taken the money, you never get on that ship. Uh, I've always wanted to take a cruise, and Florence wouldn't... There isn't going to be any Florence, Henry. Remember? But where could we hide? With enough money, you can hide anywhere. You'd shave off your mustache, get contacts instead of those uh, wire-rimmed glasses, a, a mod wig. I'd cut my hair short, dye it blonde, and get a nose bob, and put on a little weight in the right places. We'd be new people. Mm, I always wanted to have a beard. So, all right, grow a beard. Florence would never let me. Listen, Florence won't be around to object. Would I really have to... to kill her? What other way around is there? None. The trouble is, I wouldn't know how. Well, I thought of that, Henry. Here. What is it? It's a bottle of sleeping pills. Just dissolve them in a nice hot cup of tea for Florence. What more do you want? I... I think I'll have another martini. <laughs> I couldn't believe it was me sitting at an expensive restaurant, drinking in the middle of the day, and planning to murder my wife. Then I started in to think about the 20 years I'd already had with Florence, and the 20 or more I still might have to spend with her, and killing Florence began to make sense, maybe. I stole a look at Sherry, who was powdering her nose. It looked pretty good to me like it was, and I, I didn't see where she didn't have enough in all the right places to start with. That's when I made up my mind. Florence had to go. Henry Green, 5'9", 148 pounds, mouse-haired, mild, 45 years old, and safely mounted on a treadmill running day by day to stand in the same place. A man in a cage, both at work and at home. But now, in the grip of the mating urge, a tiger. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. The 
there's one thing you can say for Henry Green. Once set loose, there's nothing small about his new way of life. Within one day, he is all set to break three of the major commandments. The sixth, seventh, and eighth. Although not necessarily in that order. Murder and adultery will have to wait their turn. At the moment, he is occupied with the eighth and grand larceny at that. All right, Sherry. That was the last teller. Is she gone? Yeah. All right. Let's open up. There. That's mine. Now yours. That does it. Now get the suitcase from behind the desk while I open the vault. Here it is, Henry. Put it flat on the floor and open it. You hand me the money, and I'll pack it in. Hope there's enough room for all of it. Just take our big bills and leave a chicken feed. No. Better take everything. Empty drawers are easier to handle. What is it? Somebody's coming. Hide the suitcase. Get the vault door. Give me the bag. Oh, well, all closed up, Miss Woods. Uh, time to go. Why, Miss Burpee? But forget something? Oh, and Mr. Green, uh, honest, I'm just so embarrassed. I, I sure hate to ask you, but... But what? Well, well there, there's something I want to check in my teller's drawer. Would you please open up the vault? Uh, what? Yeah, uh, but, but we just closed up. We can't... Oh, you got to. I, I have to know if it's missing. Is what missing? My engagement ring. You see, I, I usually take it off and put it in the drawer till I go home and... Tonight, I forgot to take it out. Well, uh, can it wait till Monday? Oh, we're off. Uh, well, Tuesday. Oh, no, no, I, I got dates with Horace over the weekend, and oh, he'd have a fit if I wasn't wearing it. Besides, I, I've got to be sure if it is there. Uh-huh, well, maybe you put it in your handbag. Oh, no, no, I looked there first thing, because I, I did go to wash my hands. I know I took off the ring. Oh, now I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right here in my jacket pocket. Oh. Oh, gee, I'm sorry. Oh, I... oh, 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 that's all right. <laughs> well, I, I I, guess I'll be getting along home. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see the suitcase. I, I, I was uh, having the handle fixed before I, I packed it to uh, to go on my vacation. Oh, gosh, you don't have to explain to me. I didn't think you were robbing the bank or nothing. Uh, well, well, I, I, I got to run. Well, one of the other girls is waiting for me. Just let me make sure she's gone. And for God's sakes, let's pack up and get out of here. We were both shaking like we had a fever after that run-in with bird brain burpee. But somehow we managed to pack the money in the bag and close the outside door with a time lock. Going home in the cab, the tension was so bad, I was tempted to take one of the sleeping pills myself to calm me down, but but I resisted that. One crime leads to another. I was committed. If I lost my wits now, I stood to lose everything. Well, it's about time you got home. I had to close up the bank. Well, at least I see you remember to bring the suitcase. I'll take that. No. Huh? I, I, I mean, I'll do my own packing. <laughs> you? You can't even fold a bath towel. Well, this time I'll show you. I want you to get a little rest, dear. I'll take care of myself. No, oh, I'm not going to argue. Go ahead. Throw everything in. Higgledy-piggledy. I'll repack in the morning. You've been drinking. Well, I... Uh, just a sort of party because... I hope you didn't get too giddy so you can't manage to take your dinner out of the oven. Where are you going? Over to Mama's to leave Pussy. She's going to take care of him until we get back. Oh. Okay. W will you be long? I don't know. Why? I'm all packed. I have no problems. I, I just thought you might be tired, Florence, dear, and I, I want to get to bed early. I'm not even thinking about bed, and you'd better not either. Now you make sure you're wide awake when I get back. we got a lot to do before tomorrow. But don't I know it, Florence. Don't you worry. I, I'll be awake. <laughs> Hello? 
Sherry? Yeah? What's happened? Oh, nothing yet. I just had dinner. You mean to tell me you haven't got rid of Florence? Oh, yes. How? Well, she just uh, took the cat over to leave at her mother's. Oh, you know that isn't what I meant. I, I, I know, it's just I, I'm... Sherry, I, I, I don't know. Henry Green, you listen to me. It's now or never. But I don't know how to... Look, you take those capsules, empty the powder from them into a cup or mug or whatever, and coax Florence into having a nice relaxing drink before bed. What does she like? Uh, uh, chocolate, but... No buts, Henry. You can do it. Just put your mind to it and finish I'm just it. sorry I ever started it. Oh, Henry, when you know you're going to end up with me. Oh, okay, okay Sherry. You can trust me. It, it took a couple of shots from the Christmas brandy bottle Florence kept hidden in among her foundation garments to keep me going till Florence got back from her mother's. Luckily, by that time, she seemed tired herself, and we were finally ready for bed. Oh, did you lock the front door and put out the lights? Florence, uh, how'd you like a, a nice cup of cocoa before you go to bed? Put you right off to sleep. <sighs> oh, I'd love it. I, I, I'll get it for you. You can't. I used up the last yesterday. But you got it. You, I'm, I mean, wouldn't you like something to drink? Oh, well, I... I did get a little bit of a chill coming home. I'll, I'll take some hot tea. Oh, yes, yes. I, I, hot tea will be just right. Here's your tea, Florence. Now drink it up. In a minute, when I have my hair up. Meanwhile, I have a list of things for you to do. Me? Yes. I want you to put out the garbage, mm. check all the outside door locks, bleed the hot water tank and make sure there's no rust, oil the garage doors, replace that burned-out bulb on the basement stairs. Well, here, here, it's all listed. But this will take hours. Just do as I say. Mm. Okay, most of this wait till we get back? No. Why not? I'll tell you when you're finished. Now, on you go. Oh, don't look so pouty. It's something to keep you busy till I'm ready to go to sleep. Yeah. Okay, Florence. Good idea. Something to keep me busy till... Goodbye, Florence. What'd you say? Uh, nothing. Just goodbye. Florence? What is it? Oh, my God. What is it, Henry? Uh, uh, no, nothing. I, 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 I just thought... You were asleep. No, I just, I just can't relax somehow. Too many things on my mind. What, what was it you were going to tell me? Oh, that can wait. Oh, I wish I could sleep. Didn't, uh, uh, wasn't the tea any help? Oh, that. I poured it out. You forgot the sugar. Poured it out? I yelled and yelled for you, but you didn't answer. I must have been outside. Anyway, it tasted terrible and it was cold, so I, I just poured it down the sink. Well... Uh, how'd you like to bring me another? But with sugar. It's too late. Why? It's only just after 10 o'clock. Uh, yes, I, um, I guess I, I'm so... Oh, I'm, I'm so tired. Uh, okay, Florence, I'll get you another cup. And you used all of the capsules. Yes. Now, what do I do? There's got to be a way. How? Tell me. I haven't got a gun. I wouldn't know how to use a knife. We haven't got a rope in the house. There isn't even any string. And I haven't got the courage to even consider a, a blunt weapon. Oh, why did I ever get into this? Look, if you had a razor, couldn't you? A razor? I don't even use a safety razor because blood makes me nauseous. Just electric. I wouldn't go near the fuse box. I'd probably electrocute myself. Gas. Have you got a gas stove? Oh, great. All I have to do is say, Florence, I just robbed the bank because I'm in love with Sherry Woods and we need you out of the way, so would you please just stick your head in the unlighted oven so I can smother you? What's that? The tea kettle. Blowing the whistle on me. I guess it's only the first. Wait a minute. Smother. A pillow. Oh, Henry, that's it. A pillow. A what? You know, 
like Lawrence Olivier in that picture where he had the all the black face and he held the pillow over his wife's face and then oh, it was by Shakespeare. No, Othello. Yeah, yeah. I might just be able to manage that. <laughs> Too weak, but at least it had sugar. Oh. Henry, what are you doing standing there with that pillow? Oh, nothing. Just waiting to come to bed. Oh, well, turn out the light, for heaven's sake. I'm almost asleep. Henry! Yeah, sure. Oh. Henry, what are you doing with the pillow? Come on, it's late. What? Uh. Who's that? I don't know. Turn on the light so I can answer it. I don't know what's wrong with you. You had that pillow right over my face. Hello? Oh, oh, Mama. Yeah, what's the matter? Oh, just a minute. Henry, will you get that pillow out of the way so I can talk to my mother? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Mama. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, pussy wouldn't take his milk. Well, I can't understand. Oh, Mama, I forgot to tell you. Put a teaspoon of sugar in it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, he's used to it. Oh, no. No, Mama, you're not interrupting anything. I got all the time in the world. Hmm? Oh, well, yes, he, he doesn't like his litter basket in the bathroom. I'm going to the problem. I lay there listening to the voice droning on and on, the pillow in my hands, waiting for the moment, the moment that never came. Three martinis, two brandies caught up with me, and the next thing I knew... You fell asleep. Sherry, I was bushed. I was just knocked out. And when Florence starts talking to her mother, you just don't know. Oh, never mind that now, Henry. What are we going to do? I don't know. Is Florence still in bed? No. She got up before me. She's in the bathroom. Oh, I tell you, Henry, I don't know what to say. I've been up all night, half out of my mind, waiting to hear. Hold it. Henry, where are you? What is it? It's Florence. She's yelling for me. I'll have to call you back. Henry! Okay, Florence. I'm coming. Henry, I declare I could shout my lungs out and be dying and I couldn't get you to help. I'm here, Florence. What is it? Open the door and come in. Oh, come, come right over here to the end of the bathtub. What's wrong? I have this terrible cramp in my foot. Oh, it's killing me. Massage it quick, please. Like that? Not the left one. You fool the right. That's it. Oh, grab it and rub. Oh, be careful, idiot. Don't pull it towards you. You almost had my head underwater. You want to drown me? Suddenly, after all the trial and error, the hedging and the fudging, there it was. All I had to do was grab both feet, pull and lift up, and Florence was helpless and gone. Murder could never be made more simple. The moment of truth at last. Does Henry have the courage to go through with it? And if he does, can Sherry and he get away with larceny and murder? And having broken the Sixth and Eighth Commandments, will the Seventh be worth it all? Those are questions to be answered shortly when I return with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. I don't suppose you'd ever want to try it, but in case you do, if your bathtub has an open end, coax any obliging friend to lie in it. Seize him or her by the ankles. Repeat Henry's actions, and they are helpless. Even if they are not obliging, and no matter how strong they are, if there's water in the tub, of course, they would drown. That would be surely up to you as it is this moment, up to Henry. How long I stood there frozen, unable to move, scarcely able to breathe, after I took the action, I'll never know. I suppose Florence must have thrashed and twisted. There must have been a sound of choking and bubbling as her head stayed beneath the water. I'll never know. I don't remember... 
Well, I do remember is what brought me out of my trance. Who, 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 who's that? Uh, doorbell. Uh, uh, who? Must be Sherry. Yes, yeah, Sherry, you got to answer. <laughs> Are you Mr. Green? Why, uh, yes, uh, I am. Sal Basil here. Okay to move on in? I beg your pardon? Well, didn't the missus tell you about me? Why, I, I don't, uh, who... I'm your new who... tenant. Short term, you know? Just while you're off on a cruise. And that's my family out there in the wagon. My wife rented you our house? Yeah. For the three weeks till our house is being painted. Just got the painter started today. Hey, wait a minute. Nothing wrong, huh? I mean, I paid an advance. Mr. Basso. Basso. Yes, uh, Basso. You're sure that... Well, just let me talk to your wife a minute. We can get it all straightened there's, out. There's no need for that. It's just Well, I that... wouldn't want to have to kick up no fuss, you know. I mean, I got the painter started. My whole family and clothes moved out. I mean, I wouldn't want to drag no lawyer or, or like that into this, but... Oh, uh, no, no, there, there's no question of that. I'm, I'm sure if my wife, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, I do recall she said she had something to tell me. You see, I got the receipt right here. That the missus handwriting? Uh, that, uh... Yes, that's Florence's handwriting, all right. It, it's just we've been a little delayed in getting out of the house and if you could give me a, 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 a couple of hours... Oh, sure. Would... I am a bit early. Hey, I'll tell you what. There's a horror film in the shopping center movie house. Now, I'll take the family there and give them a thrill and come back uh, in, say, uh, a couple hours, okay? And tell the missus to have a good time on that cruise. And she shouldn't fall overboard or get drowned or nothing like that. <laughs> Oh, I thought you'd never call. Listen, baby, I'm all packed. I'll hop in a cab and come to your house. You better be ready with the bags and money, and we'll leave for the airport in the first plane. What? Why not? See, what? When is the house? Well, so what's the difference? Why can't... All right, Henry. All right, all right, don't get excited. Yeah, not on the phone. I'll be right over. I won't. We'll figure out something. After I hung up the phone, I went upstairs. There was something I had to do for Florence before Sherry got there. She was heavier than I thought, and it took me some time to dry her and get her dressed. It helped since she had all her traveling clothes lying on the bed. By the time I had her propped up in the slipper chair, I was soaking wet and shaking all over. By that time, I knew what I had to do. I opened the door to the basement, turned on the light, and went downstairs. Over in the back corner was what I was looking for, an old wardrobe trunk that used to belong to Florence's father. It was covered with dust and mildew, but I wiped it off with a rag and dragged it across the cellar and up the steps. Just a few steps more. That's it. Now we can get her in the trunk. I still think we should have cut and run. Easy now. Get her so she's sitting on the stool inside. We wouldn't have had time to, to, to get away. The Basso six or seven kids, they'd have been all over this house. Nowhere to hide, Florence. That's it. Now, to get it closed. I'll hold. You push. There. Henry. Are you sorry? I... I don't know. I'm numb. I'll try to make up to you for it. I did it for you. The crazy things a man can do. Well, at least you're, you're free. Mm. No, 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 not, not yet. Florence may be dead, but... We still haven't gotten rid of her. Oh, I wish I... Yeah, yeah, so do I. Just look at me. I'm an absolute frump. Well, Florence was a bit bigger than you. A bit? A 
if I had a twin, she'd fit in here, too. I can't go out like this. Well, this will cover you up. What is it? A raincoat. We're in luck. It started to rain. You can pull the hood over your head, and you look just like Florence. Thanks a lot. Do we have to go through all this, Henry? The neighbors might be looking out, and, and someone has got to get on that boat with me. They've got to think that Florence came aboard so she can fall overboard tonight. Uh-huh, and then I sneak off in my own clothes before the ship sails. I wish I could have you with me, but, but I can't. Oh, that's all right, Henry. I'll try to bear up. There were just too many other things to think of just then. The first, getting a cab. The second, getting it loaded and away before Mr. Basso and his family returned from the horror movie. I envied him. He was just watching one. I was living it. Okay, Mark. All ready. Lift it. Easy, easy. To try to keep our upright. Who? They are the trunk. Oh, what's the diff? You got a body in there? A what? <laughs> I'm just giving you a rip. Feels heavy enough for one. <laughs> that suits you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Fine, fine. Ah, you know, you got to be some kind of a nut to think you're going to get some old trunk like that on any of today's cabs. Them trucks went out with Jimmy Walker. Yeah, I'm just lucky you were nice enough to help out. A uh, fifth. The green ones, Mac, remember? Oh, oh, sure. Here. <laughs> okay, Clement. Uh, I, I, I just I have to make sure my wife will follow in the taxi. Well, I'm sorry, I ain't got no room in the truck for three. I'll be right back. I ain't going nowhere without you. Well, we're all set, Sherry. You trail us to the pier. Here, I'll take the suitcase. It's all right. Might as well leave it with me. Goodbye, Henry. Well, goodbye for now. Anyway, jouncing along in that miserable little pickup truck, that last goodbye seemed somehow so final. Could Sherry possibly... But I put that out of my mind as I told myself that everything was working out for the best. Just a few more hours and we'd be home free. What, what's the holdup? Search me. This is the line for the pier. Hey, you want I should go find out why it's jammed up? Nothing moving? No, I... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. Here's a cop coming along your side. Officer? Officer? All right. Knock off the horns. Yeah, mister. I, I'm, I'm trying to make a cruise ship that's sailing in about a half hour. That's I... fine, citizen. Then you're right where you belong. Just stay in line. But why? What's what's wrong? Nothing for you to worry about, I'm sure. Just some nut phoned in a bomb scare. Now, we got to search all baggage going aboard. You want to really help out? You can. Open up that trunk you got so the bomb squad can check you out. But, but I, I, I can open that trunk. My my wife has the keys. Okay. So where's your wife? Well, well, she, uh, well, she's she, in a taxi right behind her. What's room for her? What taxi? Obvious son of a gun. That one just pulled out making a U-turn. Stop her. Stop her. Uh, hold it, mister. What's going hey, on Hey, Travis, it'll come, officer. I should have known he was off his trolley right from no, the beginning. No, no, no. Take it easy, mister. You Let ain't going out of here. I bet there's a bomb in that trunk. A bomb? Yeah, yeah there, is, there isn't any bomb. Let me go. Sherry, Sherry. <laughs> Henry, wake up. What? Well, where? Oh, Florence. Where am I? Oh, I'm not surprised you don't know. Stumbling in drunk last night and waking up the first day of your vacation still calling for a drink. A drink? Well, you're not getting any. I hope you have a hangover big enough to make yourself properly ashamed of. Now, you get up out of bed and pull yourself together. Oh, yes, Florence. Oh, my head. Oh, ouch. What's that? Your suitcase. Right where you insisted on putting it last night, right next to the bed. You didn't open it. I did after you fell in the door with it when you brought it home, and I packed it for you. Now, you'll be on your feet and ready to go by the time I'm out of my bath. My mind was reeling and splitting in two at the same time. I kneeled on the floor and opened the suitcase... It contained nothing but clothes. No money, just clothes. With a shaking hand, one ear on the rushing bath water, and an eye on the bathroom door, I dialed Cherry's number. Yes? Cherry? 
Who's this? Henry. Henry who? Henry Green. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Green. I was going to call you a little later. I should think so. What happened yesterday? Oh, I wouldn't worry too much about anything. You were kind of cute, really, when you left the party. You were a bit wobbly. Party? What party? Well, the party that shot. I mean, Mr. Mercer gave when you were named vice president. I was named vice president? You don't remember much, do you? You even went all for the vault key you were supposed to give to Mr. Schaefer. I have to arrange for you to get it to him today before you leave on the cruise. Sherry, I, I mean, uh, Miss Woods, did, did we have lunch together yesterday? Why, no. I didn't have three martinis with you? Well, not at lunch. At the party. Well, I don't know how many you had, but you were pretty looped. I called you home last night, and your wife said you'd gone straight to bed without any dinner. So, it was all a dream. Oh, what did you say? Uh, uh, no, no, nothing, Sherry. I just wish I'd been able to uh, kiss you goodbye. I sit here hunched like a mouse, remembering the dream and facing the reality. And I wonder which is the real nightmare. I suppose I should be grateful it was only a dream. But on the other hand... Henry! Henry! Come in here right away! I have a cramp in my foot! I need you! Henry Green. Paper Tiger, as it turns out. Grand larceny first-degree murderer, rapacious adulterer, thirsting after a young woman's flesh, but all and only in the mind. And surely to have to go on living with someone like Florence is punishment enough to fit the crime. I'll be back shortly. is father to the thought. The thought is father to the deed. Henry Green only got two-thirds of the way along that path. Even in dreams, he never managed to break the seventh commandment. Poor Henry. But, as I said in the beginning, this was the story of a natural-born loser. Our cast included Jack Guilford, Marion Haley, Bryna Rayburn, Dan Ockel, Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I see it. There's death. The shadow of death over Tim's shoulder. And, and I'm somehow in the shadow, too. Oh, Granny, why do I have to see it? And, and then still know that I can't stop oh, it. Oh, no, my warning. Don't wreck your heart. With what can't be changed. I told you before, Granny. I won't sit by if... What is it, Colleen? What are you staring at? I see him now. They've topped a tree. And Tim's stripping it. He's all alone in a... No! No! I've got to stop it. I've got to stop it. Dear Mary in heaven... Watch over my lamb, whatever the Lord has marked her for. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. All peoples have their separate legends, their superstitions, and their fears. Julius Caesar once said that all Gaul is divided into three parts. But whatever their political alignments, the Gallic people shared their legends in common. And none more persistent and accepted than the belief in the second sight. Usually called a gift, but one wonders if perhaps it is far more the reverse of that. No. No. No! Is it Ruth? What? Oh. Oh, Granny, Bridget, I I, I must have fallen asleep. But what, what was troubling you in the dream? Oh, Granny... It was terrible. They were... They were topping a big redwood on Pickman's Hill. And and Jason swung over on his rake to cross-cut with Red Pelly. He was trimming away some branches with a, a... A small chainsaw. When all of a sudden he... He sheared right through his support line. And I saw him fall like... Like a stone. Cleared down into the ravine. Oh, it was awful, Granny. It was just like like I had seen it with my own eyes. Oh, oh Granny. Oh, Granny, don't don't cry. It, 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 it was only a dream, love. Oh, don't I wish it were, child. Oh, the Lord proved me wrong, but, but I'm afraid you're cursed with the second sight. Oh. <laughs> mystery drama, The Unearthly Gift, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Betsy Palmer. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. begin with two definitions of second sight. The unearthly capacity to see things impossible for ordinary people to see, or the ability to foretell events in the future from the shadows they cast before them. A talent bequeathed to a large, raw-boned, and rather plain girl called Ruth Ann Mitchell. She and her grandmother, Bridget Carney, are the only women at a lumber camp high in the Bitterfoot Range, which sprawls across Idaho, Washington, and half of British Columbia. Ruth and Granny cook and keep house for the lumberjacks. And what can I say, Mamsel? And Granny, we feel very bad, especially Big Red. He was up there with Jason. I told him a hundred times he used a double rig, but he never wanted to listen. Where, uh, where is Jason? Oh, he is in the wagon with Ruth. I will have to take him down the mountain to Rockfall and the main office. Well, I want to see him. Ah, no, I think that is not a good thing. He fell five, six hundred feet into that I, ravine. I, I want to see him. Let her, if she wants. Now, you'll hurry back. Mm. Yeah, to just, just as soon as I'm sure Jason gets a burial be fitting him. You've, uh, you've got room to take me, Frenchie. Ah, uh, mais oui. If you are sure you must. Uh... It's what I owe him. Not enough, but all I can do. Oh, Granny. If I knew, why couldn't I have stopped it? How can you hold back the hand of God, child? <laughs> Best Diable. This is one bad road. You want me to drive, Frenchie? You, a woman. Well, I know it like the back of my hand. My daddy was a straw boss at Greenwood's camps, and from the time I was 11, I, I grew up there. And your father, when did he die? Oh, in the, uh, the big fire. When the South Slope burned up. And your mother? She died having me. So you stay on with Granny. She is your only family. Yes, <laughs> All I have to love. And the Jason, too, you lost. Mm. Oh, Jason. 
Jason was... He was kind to me. Uh, why do you stay at the lonely camp like Greenwood with a bunch of roughneck like us? <laughs> where else would I go? To the city, you know, where perhaps you find a nice young man who... Me? <laughs> a plain, awkward country gal who stands head high or higher than most men and knows nothing but to just cook and to do the chores. Uh, Jason did not think you were so, so plain. What did you mean about... Jason, when you said you... you might have stopped it. Well, I... I, uh... I, I, I had sort of a dream. I mean, hours before you came back to camp. Just... well, just when it might have happened. I, I, I thought, Frenchie, that I, I saw the whole thing just the way it happened. As uh, my family was from Breton here in France. Uh, we are also like the Irish, what you say, Gaelic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there also is the vue de l'ombre, what you say, the, the second sight. <sighs> that is a, a gift you have. I, um, uh, I, I, I don't know, Frenchy. I just don't rightly know. <laughs> I, I don't suppose I really ever want to know. You Miss Mitchell? Yes, I am. I'm Tim Farrell, new jack for Greenwoods. Uh, Told me down at the office I'd be riding up the mountain with you. Well, that's right, Mr. Farrell. <laughs> They're just uh, gassing up the old Jeep. Have you got, uh, got your gear ready? Most of it. Uh, what you see on me? My duffel bag and axe are right there by the pumps. Well, then I guess we're ready to go. <laughs> Except first, I guess I should say howdy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, used to shake an hand to the lady, but put it there. <laughs> I'm, uh... How about making it Tim? I ain't used to Mr. Oh, uh, yeah, well, my name's Ruthann. <laughs> All right, Ruthann. Do we travel? Best we do. It's a rough trail, and I, I really prefer going it while, while it's still light. This old Jeep handles real nice. But you were right about the trail. <laughs> Maybe I should have let you drive. Well... I knew you figured I shouldn't. It's kind of nice to be a woman and just to sit down. Besides, uh, you handle the Jeep real good. Farrell, hmm? You couldn't be Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Some generations back, mostly. Though I'm just a roving lumberjack. Born in Montana, never been out of seven northwestern states in the good old U.S. of A. Oh. I don't figure you for all of that Irish either. Well, not so much on my father's side. But all the way down on my mother's. Oh, wait till you meet her mother. Granny Bridget. She cooks chow for all you jacks. Good chow? Best you've ever tasted. And I'm in love with her already. Now, what do you do? Well, I help her. Well, now, there's something to consider. If Granny comes through as strong as you promise, I may be half in love with you already without knowing. Ah. Now, that Tim Farrell you brought back here three weeks ago. Ah, he's a charmer, he is. Yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> but, um... But what, dear? Well, I, I... I don't know how to talk about it, Granny. You see something in his future? I, 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 I don't want to talk about it yet. Yet? It, 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 it just doesn't come clear. It's a full moon tonight. I reckon I'm just going to walk myself some more before I uh, go to bed. Is it Tim you're going to meet? It's no one at all but my own thoughts. Or maybe just to be alone and, and remember Jason. Don't wait up for me, Granny. I'll not close an eye till I know you're back home safe and sound. <laughs> Pretty moon, uh, ain't it, Ruth? I, I, I suppose, Big Red. I kind of hope you figure like I do that ain't hung up there for nothing. But, uh, don't look to me. I, I, I'm not your woman. Not now or ever could be. You'd still shuck me off even with Jason gone? Or with Jason here. You, you and me have nothing for each other. And don't you make no move to me. 
Even with Jason not here to stand between us. <laughs> Big as you are, you think you could hold me off if I really had a mind to? Look, I, I hope I don't have to try. I don't guess you'll have to, Ruth Ann, as long as there are three of us. Who asked you here, Tenderfoot? Butt out. If I'm not wanted. Ruth Ann? Well, let, let's just not make no fuss, all right? I'm on my way back to bed anyways. Good night. Why don't you mind your own business, Farrell? I was about to ask you the same question. I'm warning you. You're new on this crew. Don't ask for any trouble. I don't. Just the same, don't push any on me, brother. And lay off of Ruth Ann. She don't like you no more than I do. Gal, she come down to whoop so bad, eh? That even. No sight more beautiful, no sound nearer the heart. Eh? Uh, when you stop stripping your big red on me, we cut out the next big tumble, huh? Okay. Hey, hand me the big kettle, there's a love, Ruth. Uh, Ruth? Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Granny. I, w I was thinking of Tim Farrell. <laughs> Oh, I thought maybe that walk under the moon last night might not be all by yourself. <laughs> did you meet him then? Yeah, good I did, too. Big Red was pestering me again, just like before Jason died. You tell him, he as much as lays a finger on you, and I'll put broken glass in his grits. <laughs> now, don't you let that blowhard bother you. Well, it's not him that I'm worried about, Granny. It's Tim. Why? I'm I, I, I'm trying to fight it. But I see it. There's death. The shadow of death over Tim's shoulder. And and I'm somehow in the shadow too. Oh, Granny, why do I have to see it? And and, and still know that I can't stop oh, it. Oh no, my warning. Don't wreck your heart with what can't be changed. I told you before, Granny. I won't sit by if what is it, Colleen? What are you staring at? I see him now. They've topped a tree. And Tim's stripping it. He's all alone and up. No. No. I've got to stop it. I've got to stop it. Dear Mary in heaven, watch over my lamb. Whatever the Lord has marked her for. <laughs> silent supplication, an old woman prays for the one person she has left to love, a tortured girl with a terrible and unasked gift. What has that inner eye revealed to Ruth Ann as she races up the lumber trail to try to stop whatever threatens Tim Farrell? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. At the stand of trees, the lumberjack crew is thinning out. Frenchie and Chuck Turkle are on the big crosscut, finishing the high cut, while Big Red, having finished the notch, is now driving the wedges. Down the mountain, Tim is methodically stripping the branches from the top tree, his back towards them. This is the picture Ruth Ann saw in her mind's eye sees now in actuality as she struggles breathlessly up the slope. Tim! Tim! Ruth Ann! What is it? Run! Run the tree! I'm not in its path! Look back! Look back! What? Ruth! Ruth! Run to the side! Run to the side! I sure would never want one closer than that. Are you all right, Ruthann? You covered me with your body. Well, you risked your life to try to save me. Uh, I can't figure why we're not playing pulp. Oh. That tree was headed straight for where I was standing. Oh, what 
made it turn aside just far enough to miss us. The hand of God. Miss Holt, uh, uh, Tim, how are you, Ida? No, it's, it's all right, Frenchy. I don't know what happened. Wall path was set for 45 degrees off your line. Ah, uh, that, that no good tree. Sure you ain't neither of you hurt. I, uh... Oh, took a pretty good lick across the back from one of the branches. Uh, no, no, don't don't move, Tim. No, I, I can't keep lying on you. I know Miss Ruth is right. Charlie has gone for this stretcher crew. Don't move till they are here. No, but I, I can't keep I, lying I don't on. mind, Tim. I don't want you to move. You listen to a woman when she talks. If there is something and your back is broke, yes. you move. You risk your life. Oh, I take a chance. Well, that was a powerful good bowl of soup, Ruthann. Oh, glad you liked it. Here, uh, let me take the tray. How's your back today? Oh, starvel. Now I know that there ain't nothing broke, I feel I better be getting back on my feet and go. No, sir. You just stay right where you are till the doctor says that you can rise. Ruth, tell me something. Mm, I can. Where were you going when you come up the mountain that day? Wh why do you ask? I don't know. I had the feeling. I mean, they hadn't even yelled timber before you seemed to know that that was a maverick tree and it wouldn't fell right. Well, maybe it was just... Just intuition. I, I was born and bred in tree country and around camps, and I, look, I, I've got to get back down. Granny needs my help. Ruthann? Yeah? I want to thank you for saving my life. Well, if I had anything to do with it, I'm glad. Maybe someday I can find a way to make up for it. So it's taken you are with our boy Eat upstairs. Tim. Mm. Well, he saved my life. <laughs> I thought it was t'other way around. I mean, well, the branch he took across the shoulders would have... It would have caught me right across my neck, Granny, and snapped it like a chicken. Uh, he's a good lad. Are you in love with him? Ah, uh, Tim's not for me, Granny. Or any man. Ah, oh, now, Makushla. What makes you say the like of that? You know, Granny, I don't want the gift, but I can't escape it. It's, oh, it's like a lead weight around my neck or around my heart. Did my mother have it? Kathleen. <sighs> yes, she did. And did she know about, about my father? Not before she married him, or she would never have married him. It never comes till we're well out of our teens. But, Granny, did she know that that he was to die so young? <sighs> she knew. <gasps> and about herself. She knew that, too. And knowing that I would kill her in childbirth, she... She still went ahead and had me? Now, there's always the chance the good Lord will change his mind. Look at you and Tim. <gasps> Only he hasn't. What? Granny, I wish I could see it clearer. I stopped it once, but I, I don't know if I ever could again. Tim wears the shadow of violent death like like a collar. And, and somehow I'm the one who's hanging it there. Oh, Granny. Granny, I, I don't know what to do. Tim. Hi, Chuck. How's it going? <laughs> well, I reckon I'm about ready to come back and pull my weight. I'm getting tired of just chopping firewood. Yeah, it's putting you back in shape, though. I hope. You sure are one lucky tree, Jack. When that big old tree kicked around and started to fall out of line, you was dead at its tracks. And then we seen Ruthann throw up her hands and... By dad, if we both couldn't swear on a stack of Bibles, that old tree didn't just veer off to the left, so she just missed you. I guess the wind caught her. It must have been. Though I don't rightly remember any wind that day. Chuck, 
I want to ask you if you remember something else about that day. Well, sure, ask you away. You and Frenchy were making the saw cut. But Big Red cut the notch, and he was setting the wedges. Right? Oh, yeah? And that tree was lined up to fall due south? Yes, sir, Tim, that was the line. And you know I was working away on the east, 45 degrees pretty near out of the fall line. Oh, yes, you were for sure, Tim. Then how come she turned so out of line? Well, now, sometimes you'll get a tree that has a real tough core or twister on you. You or Frenchie ever had that happen to you before? Well, no. Not as you'd say, but I've heard tell... How about Big there? Red? Well, you... You, you, you'd have to ask him. Doesn't he go around bragging he can fell a tree on a dime and he ain't never missed? Well, I have heard him say to Andrew. Yeah, well, maybe I just will go ask him. Look here, Tim. You better watch your step. You get him right up. Big Red is bad medicine. <laughs> Just a minute before you go inside, Chuck. Oh, hi, Big Red. What was you and Tim Farrell getting your heads so close together over up there by the woodpile? Oh, we was we was just uh, uh, chinning. <laughs> I seen he was asking you a powerful lot of questions. I'd like to know them questions and your answers. Oh, oh Big Red, you, you you're like to break my arm. I might just do that if you don't loosen up. Well, I, I, I don't want to make no trouble. Any but... trouble, I'll handle. <clears throat> you talk. <sighs> don't leave nothing out. I want every word. Now, don't take on so, girl. You're in love with a boy. It's that, isn't it? Yes, Granny. I am in love with Tim. But that's only a little part of it. Now, don't be too sure. Is he in love with you? Oh, Granny, how could he be? I'm a plain... He won't go through that go-round again. Granny, I'm trapped. First of all, I have the vision that all I bring to him is danger. And second... Well, if I want him to love me, how can I be sure that I'm not using the power to make him? I brought you some fresh wood for the stove. Hey, hey, um, uh, did I, uh, did I break in on something? Sure not at all, Tim. How are you feeling now? Oh, I guess I'm about back to where I was, thanks to Ruth Ann. <laughs> You'll excuse me, Granny Bridget and Ruth Ann, but I got a little business here, can't we? You get yourself out of my kitchen, Red Pilly, and all your riffraff with you. Not till something gets straightened out. Well... Speak up and go. I'm talking to you, Farrell. And this time you ain't hiding behind any skirts. Chuck Turkle here tells me you're bad-mouthing me. Trying to say I dropped a tree across your back. I hadn't faced you with it yet. I wanted to get some more proof. But so long as you fetch the issue, that's what I have in mind. Glad you laid it on the table. Now, Ed, why you do this? Why you tired of... Frenchie. I'll handle this. Mr. Farrell, I'm calling you out. Pick your weapon. Knives, axes, PV poles are just bare hands. You and me's got a claim to settle. A claim? Well, let's just call it a plane falling out. Don't pay him any heed. You him. keep out of this, Ruth Ann. Indeed I won't. You're all like a bunch of children, except that you're playing with lies. Ruth Ann... And it... Maybe I want to be caught out. I'll stand no nonsense like this in my kitchen. Near on to 50 years I've served this camp. And I've never tolerated brawling in my kitchen. So you'll all take yourself out of here before I... Hey. Granny. Hey, no back, you old kids. Give us some air. Oh. Ruth. Ruth Ann, is it, is it her heart? I, I, I don't know. I've never seen Granny sick before. Frenchie, we wish you to go bring the wagon. We're taking her to town and the nearest doctor. Now you speak well. I bring the wagon to the door. <sighs> Granny, it, uh, it's nothing. It's, uh, it's just a little, it's a little fainting spell. Oh, darling. Maybe I'm, uh, 
babe. I'm getting too old for so much excitement. Where's, uh, where's, where's who? Oh, no, I'm right here beside oh. you. Put your arms around me, Makushla. All right, now the rest of you stand back. Don't you crowd them. Move, move right there. I'm still crowding you, Farrell. Not now, Big Red. There's a time for everything. Yours and mine will come. Name it. When I take Ruth Ann and Granny Carney down the mountain and make sure Granny has proper care, I'll be back. With Ruth Ann? That's up to her. If I had my if way... you're coming back, Tim, I'm coming too. Why? There are 45 lumberjacks that still got to be fed till other arrangements are made. Granny will insist on that and then... I... Then what? Whatever's got to be unwound among us... It's going to take the three of us to do it. How much does Ruth's second sight now see of the future? How much can she affect it? And how? Is the shadow of what's to come going to engulf her? Or can it be dispersed and blown away? Is the unearthly gift something that can prevail against earthly circumstance? We'll return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. Rock Falls boasts a livery stable, three assorted garages, a choice of hotels, no hospital but a small clinic with four beds and a first-rate, if overburdened, general practitioner. It couldn't have mattered less. The most efficient and highly staffed hospital would not have saved Bridget's tired heart. Like a stout old watch, the bearings were worn, the mainspring slackened. Are you there, Ruth Ann? I'm here, Granny. I'm... Uh... I'm going away, you know. Oh, no. Yes, I, I can see it in your eyes, my morning. You know. Promise me something. What? You won't go back to that camp. Granny, who's to cook for all the men? Then find another. There ought to be something better in life oh, for you. I, I don't know what it should be. You're telling me that you... And Tim... Granny, Granny, me and Tim are a dream of yours. Because you want only the, the best for me. But even if it could be, you know what lies between us. The gift. Or by another name. Curse. Where is he now? He's gone back to camp. And you let him go. Yeah, well, how could I stop him? And I... I was needed here no longer... Now go and follow him. And leave you here. My time is used up. Come close. Granny, I'm never very far away from you. Soon, soon you will be. Let me say this while I can. Some of us are the lucky ones. I was. How? I had the gift as well. Little I wanted it. It was clearer than yours. So I knew just exactly what to expect. I knew your grandfather, like your mother's poor husband, would have gone from me early. Granny, forgive me, child. I was just looking down the long corridor of time that I've left behind. Where was I? It doesn't matter, Granny. Oh, yes. Just, yes. Yes, yes, twas this. About the gift. It came to me late and left me early. I can wish you only the same. The earlier, the better. You mean... Suddenly the second sight stopped? It, it wasn't there? That's what I mean. If I still had it, wouldn't I be able to read better for what you're to do? But I, how, how can you know if it's gone? It's like love. When love comes, 
you can't mistake it if it's for real. And when the gift goes, you'll know it. Just as sure. <laughs> I love you, Ruth Ann. My love shall make you free. <laughs> Granny. Granny. Granny, what will I ever do without you? Mes amis, by the old logging rule, this contest is to the finish. By the selection of both contestants, there is no weapon but the human arm. First I ask each if they must fight. Big Red. No man's gonna make the kind of charges Tim Farrell's been making about me behind my back. And Tim? Red Pelly rules this camp and all of you. I fear. It's time someone challenged him. I'm doing that. So you will come on, set the bell. Are you both ready? Let's get on with it. Tim? You heard the man. Let's get it over with. What's going on? Uh, Miss Rose, where you come from? The doctor drove me back. Stop it! Stop it! No, 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 he's a lot camp custom. You mean no one can stop it till one man is out cold. But he's too big and strong for Tim. It's what I try to say, Miss Ruth, but your Tim Field, he must fight. Yeah. If you won't stop it, I will. Now. Because I will it. Like this. Okay, Tenderfoot. Now I'm gonna stop the living hell out of I'm you. I'm not asking no mercy. Come on. Just uh, try to stop me. Just what? Here's one last go. Mm. For luck. Uh. Uh. What? Uh. Are, are, are you going to get up? I, I can't. He, you quit? I give up. <laughs> Well, just just well, take it easy. Well, You're all right. Uh, Ruth? Yes? Boy, it seems like... seems like I've been here before. Now that Granny's gone and... and you're okay, I... I'm going away. Well, if that's what you want, you, you've got your own life to live. My own life. I ain't got the right to say it, but I... I was sort of hoping that we, we'd be sharing it. But I got nothing to offer a woman yet. We're just not for each other, Tim. Don't you know? I'm a shadow over you. That it's through me that you're risking your life. It appears to me it's through you it keeps getting saved. Twice. The legend is the third time round fate has to take its course. There's another cook here now and I'm not needed. Forget me, Tim. Please, just forget me. Look, oh, sorry, Excuse Benji. me, Miss Rose. Hey, how you feel, John? Huh? I feel like I got run over by a bulldozer. Hey, Little man. Something else won't, eh? In the inside. Why did you make Miss Ruth cry? It's kind of the other way around, Frenchie. I guess I took a wrong notion. I wanted to marry that girl. But she does not want to marry you. That's right. Did she say why? I don't know. She got some kind of crazy notion. She's a hex for me. Ah, uh, if she say that, then it is one big sham. She must be bad medicine for you. She knows. How? She has le don, the gift. She can read the future. Oh, come on. It is true. How do you think that big tree missed you that day? And how you make Big Red cry, Uncle? Well, heck with superstition, that's no real problem. What is a problem? Is it a man needs money to marry? And what do I have to offer? What? Big Red. Yeah, I was just dragging what was left of me in here to say you whipped me fair and square and the best man won. You say you're leaving? I'll be on my way by tonight. Frenchie. 
What was that I heard him saying about he wanted to get hold of some money? Uh, the poor devil. He wanted to get married, but he has no stake yet. So he wants money real bad, huh? Hey, there, Big Red. What are you doing so far from camp? Oh, just stealing me a little breather, Chuck, and having a stroll. Caps in your axe in your hand. <laughs> this here axe ain't mine. Belongs to Tim Farrell. <laughs> what you doing with it? I got a use for him. I wouldn't figure him to lend you anything of his. He didn't. He might get sore and take a notion to whoop up on you again when he finds out. <laughs> uh, he's uh, too busy packing up to leave camp. Leave? Yeah. Him and Ruth Ann. As soon as you get back with the jeep. Dragon, they think they're going to get spliced. Well, how about that? Give me a lift back to camp. Oh, sure, sure. Hop in. Got to pay money. Yes, right behind us in the sack. All done up in them neat little envelopes, huh? Just like usual. It'd be a lot of money to steal. And there sure wouldn't be much doubt if a fella got caught quick enough just where it came from. Huh? What you talking about? Just keep on driving, Chuck. Only you take the road to the flume at the fork. I got some plans for you. <laughs> What are you doing with my gear, Ray? Eh? Well, why, uh, I was just going to carry it out in the Jeep for you. I'll handle it myself. What's the Jeep doing outside there? Where's Chuck? I reckon he took the payroll over to the straw boss. You drawing yours? No. And we'll ride over there and pick it up before I drive you and Ruth Ann down to town. She's coming with us? As if you didn't know. Something funny going on. This isn't the way to the straw bosses, huh? Look out and back here. What? Hey. Oh. Oh. It sure ain't, Mr. Loverboy. The road you're going this time, I'm sure you ain't coming back. I wonder why Chuck's so late getting back. I'd like to get down the mountain before dark. He should have been here at least one hour ago. I suppose Tim is going to leave with us. Oh, we have not much transport, Miss Ruth. Why don't you take a chance and stay with him? You don't understand, Frenchie. I do, but sometimes le bon Dieu is kind. And I think that grandmère Brigitte would have wanted to... Wait. Wait a minute, Frenchie. What is it? Oh. I see it now. I see it. Red. He has the payroll in Tim's duffel. He has Tim knocked out and tied up by the fork on the way down the mountain. And Chuck is trussed up just below the big flume where it spills into the catch basin. He'll drive Tim unconscious into the ravine and send Chuck to die. Ground up in the logs in the catch basin. It'll look as if Tim killed him for the payroll. Sacrabia, he must hurry. Frenchy, go get the rest of the jacks and, and save Tim, Frenchy. I'll go get Chuck free. You, you, you crazy red. Like a fox, Chuck. Ain't no woman gonna make a sucker out of red pelly. She turned me down for chasing while I took care of him. Climb. Climb? Up to the sluice? Why? I'm sorry, Chuck, but I gotta set this up just right. Well, what are you gonna do with Tim? Tim's axe? I'm gonna bury it right in your skull, Chuck, so nobody has any doubts as to who Oh, you. no. No, you're not, Red. Ruthanne, how'd you get up here? <laughs> Many's the time as a kid when the logs weren't running, I've shooted down the flume. From the camp right to this station. Oh, I, I knew I had to move fast to stop you. You can't. It's too late. I've burned all my bridges behind me. Now, well, worst of all, it's got to be you, too. Oh, but you can't touch me, Red. I have the gift. The gift? I turned the tree aside to save Tim. And I held you back from stomping him. All with the help of God. And now, I'm going to stop you again. Run, Chuck. 
run. You go, 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 no, he can't touch me. I'm sorry it has to be this way, Ruth Ann. From the beginning, when you first come, you was all I wanted. But you turned me down. What? What are you doing? I'm going to open a sluice gate. There's 600,000 board feet of logs already on the way down. And we're going with the first that comes. If I can't have you, no one else can. Hey! You hear me? I hear you. You touch Ruth and I'll kill you. Ain't none of the three of us going to stay alive. Come on up. You put down that extra head. Until I take your foot. Go, Ruth Ann. Give me your foot. I've got his face. Damn you. Hide us. Switch your scuttle. Watch him. He has your axe. Hang on, hey. Ruth. I've got a peaty pole. All right, Red. You want to give up? Oh, bon Dieu. He cried. We have too many. Stay over the platform, Frenchie. We need Ruth. Damn it. Damn it. Oh, yes. Right. Let go of the PVT. He's got you with him. The logs carried him right down the flume and over and into the catch basin. He was ground to pieces. I'm sure glad you're safe, Annie. Are you still going? Well, Red is dead, but nothing between us has changed. One big thing is. What? When I thought I had the power to stop Red, I found I didn't, Tim. I just had to rely on myself and hang on to the axe that he was trying to swing down on you. Are, are you are you telling me? Mm. The gift's gone. I don't have to be afraid anymore. It's a new life. It sure is. I. What? What did you call me back then? Annie. That's a new name for a new life. And the one that's going to be my wife's. Come on, Annie Farrell. Kiss me. If you like the name. <laughs> Anything you want to give me is just exactly what I like. <laughs> Think of all the gifts you personally may have lost in your time and how much you mourn them. Then think of the dread, oppressive gift that Ruth Ann lost and celebrate it with her. Sometimes I do have stories to tell you that end with that fond, childish phrase, and so they lived happily ever after. I'll be back shortly. Nothing in this life we live can or should ever be expected to be perfect. We can only wish and hope that as a sizable clutch of feral offspring arrive and grow, that not too many of the girl children will be afflicted or blessed with the gift. It all depends, doesn't it, on how bright and dark our separate futures may be. For myself, either way, I'd rather not know. Who needs to live for more than today? Our cast included Betsy Palmer, Carmen Matthews, Mason Adams, Jackson Beck, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. He must have been going 60 miles an hour on that road. The speed limit there was only about 30. They haven't arrested him, have they? No. But the police were called, weren't they? Yes, yes. They know Mark, of course. He's lived here all his life. Didn't they give Mark a sobriety test? No, nobody even suggested it. I mean, Mark didn't seem to be drunk at all. And of course, he didn't say he'd been drinking. He didn't mention the speed he was traveling at. Well, they asked him. Mark said he was going 35, and the woman just stepped out in front of him. You see. He had to say it, Daddy. I mean, otherwise it would have been a crime, wouldn't it? I think it's called vehicular homicide. <laughs> well, he should go to prison for that, couldn't he? Perhaps. Oh, Daddy. Go now. What did you say? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams.